Hey everyone, welcome to the CFS Recovery Channel. And as someone who has struggled with a severe case of CFS for almost five years, I know what it's like to feel hopeless and scared. I tried all of the alternative options and worked with a specialist in the field, and I'm now a success story with a full recovery. I tried all the alternative options and worked with a specialist in the field, and I am now a success story with a full recovery. I've documented my journey and I have the papers to prove it. I have the videos, the photos, just to show you guys that I truly went through this and I have had the opportunity to teach my methods to people all around the world. So today I've got something special for you, a compilation of the most popular, most helpful videos on my channel, all in one place, all in one video for your convenience. So this video is going to be just over two hours long and will cover the most important recovery principles and frameworks that will help you on your journey towards healing and growth. There are some timestamps below in the description, so feel free to skip to certain parts and listen in on only the segments that feel applicable to your situation. So sit back, relax, grab a paper and pen if you can, just to take some notes down. You might have to watch this a few times and get ready to dive into the world of recovery. Let's get started. How's it going guys? Miguel here from CFS Recovery. In this video, we're gonna be talking about getting rid of fatigue. Now, fatigue is always gonna be underlying even when other symptoms come and go. Um, fatigue is usually one of the first things to come about early in the beginning stages of this illness when you probably first started to notice you're getting sick or you know, as you got more and more sick, you noticed that the fatigue starting to pile on more and more and then other symptoms were actually introduced. Now. I wanna share something with you. I've created this presentation to kind of paint the picture and help you understand not just how to get rid of it, but first of all, we need to understand how it came about in the first place in order to be able to get rid of it. Now, right off the bat, I just wanna make it very clear that the deeper you're in this illness, the longer you've had it, the more intense the feelings are, then obviously the more fatigued you will be. And you might've noticed that usually pain and other strange symptoms will come along after you've been ill for you know, a longer period of time. So like I said, I've created this kind of visual here to, to paint that picture for you. So first we need to understand how the fatigue is even there in the first place. And once we understand that, it will give you an understanding of how all of this works. So right off the bat, if you watch my channel, then you've probably seen my other videos where I talk about the stress threshold and how stress is really the, the cause of a lot of these symptoms and the fatigue that you're feeling. So everybody has this max stress threshold. If you look right here, I created this, this chart kind of to show the different levels of your threshold for stress. So let's say you have a little bit of stress, right? Everybody can handle a little bit of stress. That's fine. That's normal. We feel stress on a daily basis, but as things start to pile up, there's more and more stress, then we get closer to this max stress threshold. Now, let's say we have more stressor here, we're about halfway, we continue piling on the stress, emotional, mental, physical, um, spiritual, whatever it is, there is stress in our lives, then we continue to introduce it, maybe not even consciously, maybe we're unconsciously introducing lots of stress into our lives. But once you reach that max stress threshold, then, then that's it, your body, doesn't go into shutdown mode, but then it starts to warn you of certain things. So once you do hit that max stress threshold, your body starts sending you warnings to slow down because it can only handle so much stress. It starts to see any type of stress, whether physical or mental, whether it's real or not real at all, it will send you signals to slow down. And first it starts sending you warnings in the form of fatigue. So we'll start sending you fatigue. Now for a lot of people, we'll just tell ourselves, oh, yeah, we feel like we're tired. I'm just under the weather. You know, if I sleep a bit more, then it'll go away. But maybe I could just keep pushing through for a little bit more, whether it's in your job or relationships or life, right? When the stress starts to pile on and you go above that max stress threshold, your body now starts to send you warnings to slow down. So that's kind of step one. And if you continue to push through it for a prolonged period of time, well, guess what? it gets to that next level. Your body starts to send you more warnings to slow down. It starts to send you actual symptoms, heart palpitations, um, you know, lightheadedness, dizziness, anything to really slow you down and stop you from continuing to pile on the stress. And a lot of people, they'll be like, okay, I'm feeling tired, getting some headaches now, but you know, it's fine, I'll just push through it. 
And keep in mind, these periods of times when your body's sending you warnings to slow down, giving you fatigue, and when it gives you symptoms, this can last anywhere from a few months to a few years. Um, for me, you know, I was feeling fatigued long before I got hit with that CFS um, with all those severe, severe symptoms to the point where I was bedridden. I was feeling fatigued for a long time, probably like three years. Um, you know, you almost feel like you're living in another dimension, your brain's out of it. Um, you know, you get some vertigo sometimes, the room's kind of moving around, your vision gets blurry, that's a big one. Um, as you continue to try to push through all these symptoms and, and the fatigue, your body sends you more and more signals, essentially screaming out saying, stop, you need to slow down. A lot of times, we'll continue to keep pushing through it. Now the body will send you even more warnings to slow down, which is more symptoms. This is when, when you start getting more palpitations, more anxiety, more um, insomnia, and you just can't seem to shut down. You're feeling wired and buzzed. And uh, if you continue pushing through that, um, whether you know it's physical work, like I said, or whether you continue taking like, supplements that are hard on your body that mess with the nervous systems, um, or you're taking substances or anything like that, at this point, your body is pretty susceptible to to shutting down because it's already makes its it's already reached its max stress threshold. And you've already gone past the first warning, the second round of warnings, the third round of warnings. At this point, a lot of things can happen where it can just wipe you out, whether it's a virus that you get. There's a couple of people in Recovery Jumpstart. Um, they were doing okay, and then all of a sudden a virus came out uh, of nowhere, and it just wiped them out. And then it put them over the edge to that next level, and the next level is essentially the body goes down into lockdown mode. The CFS is triggered. This is where you are you can be bedridden you can not be able to get out of the house maybe your anxiety is through the roof but essentially your body is in survival mode because you put on so much stress over time um, that even the smallest things your brain will perceive them as threats and so the brain just shuts down it goes into hiding mode um, essentially what it does the reason it gives you lots of fatigue and lots of symptoms it's to put a limiter on your body to make sure you're not going out you're not exposing yourself to all these different situations so the way the brain thinks is if it can if it can force you to you know stay home um stay safe and just not go anywhere then it's going to avoid a lot of this new stimulus and this is where a lot of people get stuck the body goes into lockdown mode the cfs gets triggered and so you know a lot of people are focusing down here it's how do i get rid of the fatigue the fatigue won't go away but we have to understand that that's going to come after we figure this out and this out and this out and we deal with all these things because when it gets to this point we need to deal with that first in order to start the recovery process then we need to work backwards so i mean if you're watching these videos right now then you're probably somewhere along these stages maybe you're just getting fatigued maybe you're getting fatigue and symptoms maybe you're getting fatigue and lots of symptoms or maybe you're in the state where you're completely bedridden and you, you just can't get up and move around the house, you can't do laundry or dishwasher, uh, you can't load your dishwasher, you can't do a lot of stuff, you're probably at that point, you know, when you're about here. And so if you're watching these videos, you're probably not like here or here or here. You're probably past your max stress threshold and you're, you're somewhere along these lines. But like I said, we need to deal with this first in order to start the recovery process. We need to deal with a CFS that's been triggered, the the nervous system gone wild. I made a video a few weeks ago, you can click on it right up here, where I, I talk about really just the puzzle of CFS and how it can be very confusing and that's where a lot of people get stuck. And so in order to deal with this, you know, that, that that's a whole separate topic. Actually, I created a program specifically to help you guys get out of lockdown mode and really to get rid of all of this stuff and work backwards. But essentially in Recovery Jumpstart, the way we approach the solution to this problem is, Number one, it's gonna be becoming aware of what's going on. Um, really just aware of your thoughts and the way your body's responding because a lot of times, well, not even a lot of times, most of the time you are gonna be running on autopilot. At least your nervous system will be and it's just gonna take you anywhere it wants to go. It's gonna make you panic and become anxious and overreact to certain symptoms. You'll get mood swings, brain fog, all those things. But number one is awareness. Number two, we need to work on the mindset because it's very easy to get down into this negative pit and this hole that you're in where you literally just stay stuck. Once we figure out the awareness and the mindset and we snap you out of autopilot, 
then we're able to move on to the next part, which is essential to recovering. This is almost like laying the foundation, but understanding the science of what's going on, because the more you understand what's going on with your body, the less you fear it, the less anxiety you have. And the more clear direction you have and, and the easier it is to go down that recovery path versus trying all these different things and trying to, to go to this doctor or this doctor or trying this solution and this solution. And it just, you know, it keeps you running in circles. So in the recovery jumpstart program, we help you understand the science, but we were also by your side the entire time. So we're hopping on weekly group coaching calls just to make sure everybody is on track. Um, once you understand the science, then you can put these strategies into practice. So we've actually created tasks in the program and homework for people to do nothing super overwhelming, but there are certain things you have to do in a certain order in order to really recover. And once you put that into practice, then you're just on that recovery journey. You're just going to be focusing on increasing your progress cycles, doing more and more, obviously pulling back as well. But we go into detail in all of that in recovery jumpstart. You know, I just wanted to break this down for you guys to understand that you know you can't just get rid of fatigue right away it's going to be one of the secondary things that comes off you need to deal with the immediate symptoms first you need to deal with taking the limiter essentially off of your brain off of your primal brain and once you retrain that then your body and your brain goes okay it, it's safe now we can give more energy because we're going to allow this individual this body to go out into the world and and really expose itself to potentially more stressors but you need to regain trust with your brain and your body and that's something and that's something that we dive deep into in recovery jumpstart but in terms of getting rid of fatigue you can't just go for the fatigue you can't just get rid of it and if you try to treat it it's only going to make the problem worse for me i was trying to do iv treatments for the longest time i was doing myers cocktails vitamin b12 injections um iv drips i did over a hundred vitamin b12 iv drips over a two-year period that's a lot of iv drips and yeah it gave me a lot of energy in the beginning it took away the fatigue but i still had all those other symptoms going on because my brain i was essentially overriding my brain's power over my body with these external things and once those iv drips started to wear off and my tolerance became higher and higher and i needed more and more ivs just to feel a bit better it's actually almost like a miracle I was able to get out of it because I was in such a bad state. But fatigue is something that is is not going to be immediate. That's going to be secondary. The first thing that's going to go is the pain, um, the symptoms, the immediate stressors. That's going to go first. Um, there's no way to do it the other way around. You can't just get rid of fatigue and, and all the pain is going to be there. You have to get rid of the outer layers first and then you're able to go deeper and deeper in terms of you know, what started first. So if we go back to here, once we get this under control up here, then we're able to kind of peel the layers of the onion. Then we're able to deal with these symptoms over here. Um, you know, just by doing what we teach in Recovery Jumpstart, get rid of even more symptoms down here. And then down here is when fatigue starts to come off, the body starts to go, okay, it, it's pretty safe now. You know, we can, we can do a lot more things. So as we take these off, you're able to get down to fatigue. Once the fatigue comes off, then the stressors, you know, it's easy and easier to deal with the stressors. No one's going to live with absolutely zero stress. This is almost like the safe zone over here. But as long as you're not going over your max stress threshold for prolonged periods of time, that's important. For prolonged periods of time, then you're going to be okay. And you're not going to end up, you know, going down the road of having CFS again. How's it going guys? Miguel here from CFS Recovery. This channel is dedicated to helping people recover from chronic fatigue syndrome or any other hypersensitive nervous system disorder. In this video specifically, I'm going to be talking about the internal buzzing that you might be experiencing, the vibrations, the feeling like there's an earthquake happening sometimes, and just the kind of trembling that a lot of people with CFS experience. Now, if you're one of those people experiencing that, then you're in the right place because I'm going to talk about what I found to be causing it as well as what you can do about it to fix it once and for all. Now, I did not like this symptom at all. I didn't like any symptoms. I had over 50 of them at one point. But this was a symptom that was sticking around 24-7. It never really seemed to go away. It felt like I was plugged into an electrical socket 24-7.
And it's hard to describe this to a normal person who has never experienced this before, but if you're watching this video right now, then I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. You feel wired, you feel jittery. When you try to relax, you can't really relax because sure, you're not moving, but internally it feels like something is just being electrocuted. Almost that kind of feeling, right? Now, I used to feel this when I was trying to fall asleep, the moment I woke up, when I was walking around doing things, and it got to the point sometimes where I would actually be trembling. If I would hold my hand out like this, now it's normal, but back in the day, it was shaking, and I was always trembling. My nervous system was always on edge. That's what it felt like. It felt like at any moment, you could just explode. There were other times when I would be standing around with my friends. When This is when it wasn't as severe, but we'd be standing around, and then all of a sudden, I would feel the floor shake, and I'd look around and ask them, I was like, did you guys feel that? It was definitely an earthquake, and they just look at me like, no, it was no earthquake, man, it was just you. And I'd be like, okay, that's weird because I could have sworn there was an earthquake. So I had a lot of these internal tremors, and the wired buzzing feeling was very annoying because I could not sleep. I think this was one of the big factors that led to a lot of insomnia because at nighttime, like I mentioned earlier, I could not relax. No matter how comfy my bed was, no matter how dark the room was, no matter how fluffy the pillows were, I just could not relax. And that led to my thoughts as well. Not only was my body just trembling and wired, I felt like my brain was wired too. It's like I couldn't stop my thoughts. My thoughts, it was like a freight train that once the thoughts started going, it just went and it just snowballed and into all these different things. And next thing you know, there's a thought here, here, here. And it, it felt like my brain was wired. Now I understand what's going on a lot more. Sometimes you feel more wired than other times. Sometimes you actually have these windows where you actually feel decent. But for most people, most of the time they are wired and sometimes it's 24 seven. But the way I describe it to people from what I experience is your nervous system is run on an electrical impulse. It is literally run on electricity. So when we have this buzzing and internal vibration feeling, it's kind of like your nervous system being completely turned up into sympathetic mode. If we think of like a dial, if we think of a dial and we have zero as parasympathetic, which you can't ever get to zero because that means you're dead. So it's always gonna be probably around a one, right? So let's say one to 10. On one, that's more so parasympathetic. That's when you're in a deep sleep. 10 is when you are in a full-blown panic attack and your body is just extremely sensitive and, and this could be when your symptoms are flaring up too. Now, what happens is our nervous system can get stuck at certain levels. So when you have CFS, typically your body is stuck in a hypersensitive state, in a more sympathetic state, in sympathetic overdrive, and it's stuck at a seven or an eight. What I see is that leveler, the more it's turned up, the more stimulation you have within the body. It's like someone turning up the voltage on the electricity in your body between your nervous system functions, right? So the higher you turn it up, the more wired you're gonna feel. And the thing that has a direct effect on the level of voltage on your body is stimulus, any kind of stimulus. It could be physical, could be mental, could be emotional. But essentially, when your nervous system is turned up to a certain point, that's like electricity happening in the body. So if it's very high, if your nervous system is very stimulated and that voltage is turned up due to the stimulus, then you will feel more of these internal vibrations. With this symptom of buzzing and vibration, it's the same approach as any other symptom in CFS. You have to just throw it under the same umbrella as everything else. Throw it under the umbrella of a hypersensitive nervous system issue. We can do things that can help the body start to shift into a more sympathetic state, but to have lasting change, you need to learn to internally turn the knob down or the level down on the voltage of your nervous system. You could call it voltage, you could call it stimulus, but overall, you wanna be able to turn that down internally in addition to other things you're doing. So I recommend people do things like cool showers, like acupressure mats, like sleeping with a mask on at night to block out any light. All these things are tools that can help, but they won't necessarily solve the problem long-term if you don't learn how to do this internally. Now, once I started dealing with one of the main stimuli that kept my nervous system turned on, then I was able to start having less and less of this wired feeling, less and less of the vibrations, the buzzing, 
less of the feeling like I was plugged into an electrical socket 24 seven. And the way I did that was lowering the main stimulus that was causing a lot of this, which was the emotional and the mental stress, the emotional and a mental stress that I was placing on the nervous system. A lot of times those things are overlooked because here's the problem. You could be resting physically, lying in bed, doing absolutely nothing. And you might be feeling the same, if not worse. And that's what happened to me. When I was living with my grandparents for eight months, I was not getting out of bed. The only time I got out of bed was one time a day and that was to go to the washroom. And even doing that really hit me hard. My grandma had to help me get to the washroom. I had to hold on to her. Keep in mind, at the time I was 22 years old and she was 72. She was 50 years older than me. I should have been the one helping her, but she was the one helping me. So there was definitely a lot of guilt with that, a lot of kind of shame. And then I was also putting a lot of stress on myself because you know I had too much time to sit and feel sorry for myself throughout the day and just think, oh, should I do this? Should I do that? I'm scared to do this because it's gonna trigger symptoms. I had no idea what was going on. And that's the biggest thing. I had zero idea what direction to go, what to do, should I be taking supplements? Do I need to fly out to some other country to find a specialist who deals with this? Luckily, I found a doctor. Well, I didn't find a doctor, he found me in the hospital. I ended up in the hospital, I was in the intensive care unit for a month in really rough shape. They transferred me to another wing where I met my doctor and he broke down exactly what was going on. And that's what helped me lower the emotional and mental stress I had about everything that was going on because I knew the way out. He pretty much gave me the roadmap and the roadmap is something I break down in Recovery Jumpstart, the exact steps I take because it is a process, right? You have to focus on specific things. The diagrams he broke down, I actually put them into a document to simplify everything. That way people like yourself can refer to it as a roadmap, as something that guides them along the way in recovery. If you were interested in seeing that, I call it the Recovery Science Blueprint. You can click the link down below, you could check it out and see if it's something you wanna have on hand and save on your phone that you can refer to when you're feeling a loss. But once I started applying the principles and work on making my nervous system less hypersensitive, once I started focusing on that, then all of these other problems started to lift, right? They didn't lift overnight, but they started to lift. My progress was 10 times faster than it was in the previous eight months. In fact, it was like a million percent better because the previous eight months, I was actually getting worse and worse. Now I was actually getting better very quickly, but it was still a journey ahead. It didn't happen overnight, but in terms of making those symptoms go away, you can't work on them immediately. You can do things like cool showers and um, acupressure mats that can help temporarily, but in order to make it go away for good, along with all of the other symptoms you might have, including the fatigue, anxiety, heart palpitations, pot symptoms, anything else you might be feeling, you do have to attack this as one problem. And that problem is the hypersensitive nervous system issue. If you fix that problem, you fix all the other sub problems under it, all the problems that we've thrown under the umbrella. How's it going guys? Miguel here from CFS Recovery. In this video, I'm going to be talking about adrenaline rushes and how to deal with them. Now, adrenaline rushes are a very normal part of recovery. Not normal for the average person, but when you are going through something like CFS or you have a hypersensitive nervous system, you might feel that you're wired 24 seven. You might feel like there's always adrenaline, always some kind of buzzing happening in your body and just know right off the bat, that is very common for somebody who has CFS or any kind of hypersensitive nervous system. Now, for me, when I was going through this illness, not a lot of times where I didn't have this feeling, especially when I got to that point where I was mainly bedridden or mainly couch bound or even house ridden, I would feel like there was this constant tension inside and not even just physically, but with my own thoughts. There would be a lot of times where I would do these things or expand activity and my mind would just be running a thousand miles an hour. And it's almost like this excited, borderline manic feeling. Like you can't even slow down your thoughts and you just feel super, super excited. Like you just wanna go, go, go. And looking back now, a lot of that was just adrenaline being constantly dumped into my bloodstream. So I had to get to a point where I was unfazed by that, um, especially when I was at first very afraid of that sensation of the trembling, the buzzing, and I actually created a video right up here where you can watch that, where I talk about the vibrations and internal tremors. But with the adrenaline rushes, 
I found that it didn't just affect my physical symptoms, my physical body, but it also affected my mind. I didn't know how to slow down my thoughts. And there were times when I legitimately thought that I was going crazy, especially as I was starting to get better, as I was starting to learn these concepts. And I knew not to panic when my symptoms came. I knew to keep my composure as much as I could, but I found that when I would increase activity, I would have these buzzing sensations in my body, but also I would get really, really, really excited. Like I'd have this burst of creativity or this burst of thoughts, like I didn't know how to stop it. So I had to learn to separate myself from those things because as time went on, I would have less of these crazy surges in physical and mental energy. A lot of times it wasn't even just physical energy, it was mental. I may have had a lot of fatigue at the time, but my mind was racing and racing and the thoughts just could not stop. No matter what I did, I couldn't control them. So there were many times where I had to learn to separate myself from my thoughts and as well as my symptoms. So let's touch on the physical aspect first and then we'll touch on the mental aspect. So the physical aspect is the adrenaline in the body. I found that these adrenaline surges were literally just adjustment period symptoms. That's all they were. Because there are certain phases during an adjustment period where you'll feel more wired. You'll maybe feel more pain. If you don't feel pain, then you'll feel other things. But it typically follows these steps. Like your symptoms flare up, then you feel really wired and anxious, and then you feel really tired and fatigued. And then your body restabilizes. And we've found that pattern looking at the people in our recovery jumpstart program, we have seen this over and over and over again, and it happens to a T for the most part. There's some cases where it doesn't really follow that trajectory, but that's typically what happens. You increase activity, you have a symptom flare up, then you feel super wired, then your body dips down to this opposite direction where it's like really fatigued and you feel really lethargic, and then your body comes out of it. So just know that's pretty normal. I had to become really good at separating my mental state, my thoughts, like who I was, the thoughts I was in control of. I had to learn to separate those from my physical symptoms in my body. So a lot of times it felt like a bomb went off in my body and I was just shaking and trembling and my heart rate was very, very high and it was just pounding in my chest. I had to separate from those physical symptoms. So physically it was just chaos in my body, but mentally I was like, I was completely calm. So you imagine those beautiful, peaceful lakes, you know, in like the Disney intros. My mind was like a calm lake. It was like a reflection glass on the surface of that lake where if you throw a pebble, you could see ripples throughout the entire lake because that's how calm it was. So below the surface, you know, physically, my body was freaking out. Mentally, I was like, hmm, yeah, whatever. It is what it is. It's just symptoms. There was very little fear and anxiety but it wasn't completely gone, it was there, but I knew that this would happen. And I knew that nothing bad would come of it because I knew that was just the trajectory that happened every single time that I tried to do activity, things would flare up. So I became really good at predicting my symptoms, but I would never predict them. When they did show up, it was not a curveball. It was not a mystery or a surprise anymore. I knew exactly what I needed to do. And so when the symptoms came up, there was no emotional attachment to that. And if there was, it was very, very minuscule, very tiny. For the most part, completely indifferent mentally. So there's two things that are happening here. Physically, your body can be freaking out, but mentally you're just like, ah, it is what it is. It's going to be there. Whatever I do, there's not a whole lot that I could do to make it better in this specific moment, but there is a lot that I can do to make it worse. If I start panicking and freaking out, these symptoms, this adrenaline rush will get worse and worse and it could turn into a panic attack. And even if it does turn into a panic attack, you need to be okay and accept that it's literally just a glitch in the body. So once you become okay with that, there's a second part that we have to look at and it's your thoughts because they can run wild, especially when you're in that wired phase. Your mind will be jumping all over the place. I find that that's a little more difficult to deal with than the physical symptoms because you know it's in your own head. Right? You can feel like you're going crazy sometimes, but even just knowing that's normal and that actually happens, it puts you at ease because you don't feel like you're going crazy. When you're having all these intrusive thoughts and your mind is just in go, go, go mode, you're able to kind of take a step back and look at your surface level thoughts, but deep inside you're observing it, right? You're looking at your thoughts like, wow, there's a lot going on. Cool. It, very interesting. But you're aware of what's happening when you're not aware and you can't separate you know, all these intrusive thoughts from your own personal thoughts. That's when it gets tricky. 
But once you become better at being aware of these things popping in and out, you know, that's when you can make a lot of progress because no matter how intense the adrenaline surge is, you can always bring it back to a Zen state where at the very core, you fully understand that, okay, I'm going to be okay. I'm safe. My body's just having this glitch and this is something that happens, right? No need to put a label on this. It's not bad. It's not that I'm getting worse. I didn't go backwards. It's not a setback. It, it just is. This is science. My body is just having an adrenaline dump. So once you get to that level of confidence, you become okay with these symptoms, not just the physical symptoms with the mental symptoms. And you know that this is like a storm that is passing. This is like a storm that is temporary. You know that two, three, four days down the road, maybe a week down the road, you know, you're going to come out of this. Those week long ones are pretty intense, but if you're wired for a few days at a time, that's completely normal. So just know that this is a glitch in your body. This is a glitch in your nervous system. This is not you going crazy. Like this is actually very common for people with CFS. So once you understand that it really takes the teeth out of the monster, but that's how I dealt with adrenaline surges and the feeling like I was going crazy. It really, really helped. So once you become okay with that and you almost get comfortable and once you become completely indifferent to any of the symptoms and even if your body is throwing you curveball symptoms and random things are popping up here and there you're going to be okay and you're always going to progress to a better level that's how i did it that's how i went from being completely bedridden in a hospital literally had to drink my food sometimes to walking up a mountain in hawaii you know that and that was in 11 months so to have that transformation, you do have to be very confident in the information, right? Think of this information as your safety net. You know that you can't go back to square one. And I had that feeling as well. You know, when my symptoms were flaring up really bad in the past, I would think, oh man, I overdid it. I shouldn't have done that. Like now I just set myself back two weeks, two months. Now I'm going to be sick even longer. Oh man, am I ever actually going to recover? So you start the snowball, but after I learned all of this stuff and I was putting it into practice, my symptoms would be flaring up and I'd look at it and be like, okay, it is what it is. It's going to be gone in a few days or next week or whatever. That's the level that you want to get through. And you know, I did have a panic attack about a year ago. I don't know why it happened. I think I was just working a ton. And I remember it was like 1 AM in the morning and I was hungry. So I went to go get this really unhealthy food. I went to this place called Denny's in North America, but I think I had like fried chicken fries and then all this sauce and it was just not good. So I woke up at like 3 AM and I felt like my heart was just on fire. It was burning. I was having heartburn. And so at the time, like in my mind, I was having thoughts of, Oh, all this acid reflux, it's melted through my esophagus and it's seeping into my heart and I'm going to have a heart attack. And then I woke up at 3 AM and my heart was just pounding, like pounding. And I did have a panic attack. I had adrenaline surges and it was really uncomfortable for about five to 10 minutes, right? Because after you have a panic attack, if you know what it's like, if you've been through this before, you know that there's the panic attack and then there's the aftermath where you're like scared to move and you're like, shoot, I hope it doesn't happen again. So I was pretty frozen for about five to 10 minutes. And then after that, I was like, whoa, that was pretty cool. That was like a roller coaster ride. That was intense. But because I knew I wasn't gonna die and I knew these thoughts were being planted in my head, because it was my nervous system trying to protect me and trying to go into complete survival mode, I wasn't buying into them because I knew that was happening. I knew what it was trying to do. So I didn't freak out. So yes, it was scary at the time. I felt a lot of fear, but you're able to move past it a lot faster. So 10 minutes after that episode, I was like, whoa, that was interesting. And I couldn't care less if it came again because I knew it was just a mechanism of the nervous system. So like I said, it takes the teeth out of the monster quite a bit. And just knowing this knowledge allows you to, to keep your sanity when you feel like you're losing your sanity. Hey well, guys, Miguel here from CFS Recovery. This channel is dedicated to helping people recover from chronic fatigue syndrome and all the other strange symptoms that come along with it. I was sick for about four and a half years and 
Luckily, I met a doctor who taught me all these things. So now I teach other people all around the world how to recover. So in this video, I want to talk about brain fog and CFS or chronic fatigue syndrome. Brain fog is one of the main symptoms of a hypersensitive nervous system. So a lot of you might be wondering, do I have CFS? Because I have some brain fog. I don't even know if it's real brain fog. It just feels like I can't think clearly. And most of all, how do we fix it? So first of all, brain fog, it essentially feels like you're in a never ending daydream. And there's a really great comment. I think it was a perfect description that sums it all up that one of the subscribers left. I'll pop it up right here. Brain fog essentially feels like a never ending daydream that you feel like you're zoned out. You know how when you're looking at something and then zone out and it's hard to peel your eyes off of whatever you're looking at. Say you're looking at a wall, you get really fixated on it. One spot on the wall and it's hard to look away. That's, that's what brain fog is. You can't think straight, memory loss, uh, short term memory, inability to comprehend simple ideas or simple topics or inability to keep up with the conversation. There were lots of times when I have lots of brain fog, I was essentially trying to explain something and then mid sentence, I literally forgot what I was saying. So it felt like I was going crazy. In addition to a bunch of other things, there's some dissociation, some derealization. You feel like you're living in a dream or you're living in this other dimension. And I have a lot of experience dealing with this, but today I, I no longer deal with it. It's not an issue for me. I can think pretty clearly, but there was a time when I could barely string a sentence together and uh, I had some severe brain fog. Before I got really sick with CFS, before I was bedridden, the brain fog started happening first. And that's actually one of the first symptoms that I had without even realizing I had CFS or I had a hypersensitive nervous system. I had a lot of anxiety, but at the same time, I also had lots of brain fog. Like I couldn't think straight. And also my thinking was just clouded. I, I felt like I was in this other dimension. So there were times when I was sleeping and, and uh, I wouldn't sleep much because I was just working a busy job. I was in university. I was also trying to keep up working out. I was running off of energy drinks and supplements and I would go to sleep. And when I would wake up after about four or five hours, because I didn't really give myself that much time to sleep, to be honest, I was burning the candle on both ends. But when I would wake up it ne it didn't feel like my brain woke up physically, I was awake, but my brain felt like it was asleep. Like I would go to the washroom and as I'm standing there, it felt like I was moving on a boat and it felt like I was in a dream, but physically I was awake. So it's, it's kind of hard to describe it. Things didn't feel real. It, it literally felt like I was in a different dimension and I would go to university, go to class. I would work out, exercise, do all those things. But it, it felt like there was some kind of barrier between me and everything else around me. And I didn't realize it, but at the time that was my brain essentially screaming out to me, we can't handle any more mental stress, mental capacity. So my perspective on brain fog, essentially we have these different buckets of stress capacity in our body. We have like the mental threshold, we have the emotional threshold and then the physical threshold. Most people who get CFS, not all of them, but most of them are overthinkers, overachievers, over analyzers. Mentally, their brain is running constantly. It's always analyzing, always, doing mental calculations of different scenarios that can play out. And a lot of times it can drive us crazy. So for me, that was definitely the case. My mental capacity was completely maxed out. So say this is my mental capacity. I was about here. And then once it started to spill over, that's when I started seeing more and more glimpses of this brain fog. So essentially my brain was saying, look, we cannot handle any more capacity for mental functioning. We can't handle any more capacity for overthinking. So it literally tunes out. It just zones out. It doesn't want to think because it's been thinking too much, too hard for too long. And so it, it shuts off that thinking mode. So now you, you're just, co you find that when you have brain fog, it's really hard to think. So you essentially go from this overthinker, over analyzer to not even being able to think it swings in the complete opposite direction. And that's something I find so often when people do get hit hard with CFS, they go from this major overthinker to not being able to think like the simplest of things. But even that not being able to think how they used to, that stresses them out, which leads to even more hypersensitivity of the nervous system. So then you start to dissociate your brain kind of checks out mentally. It's like, okay, too much thought, too much thinking you're putting me under too much stress. I'm just going to back off and go into autopilot mode. So what it is, at least that's what I found. I was in autopilot mode and my brain did not want to engage in any mental activity. So even something like trying to read a book or 
trying to plan out what I was gonna do the following week, I had a hard time doing it. Like it just didn't make sense. I could look at numbers on a paper and you know, I could do basic math and easy things that are black and white. But when it came to like making decisions and all of these thoughts, it was really difficult for me because the nervous system was just completely checked out. The brain and the nervous system, they're essentially the same. They are completely linked. The brain is the driver of the nervous system and sometimes it just checks out when it reaches its limits. So in terms of mental capacity, when that is completely maxed out, when we go over that threshold, that's when you start to get things like brain fog which can then lead to other things. Typically, it puts a lot of stress on the nervous system physically as well, because people tend to stay up late, they can't sleep, they're not getting enough rest, their body's always hyper-stimulated, so then they end up being really fatigued as well, which then leads to other things. The more you fill up these buckets and thresholds for stress, whether mental, emotional, or physical, or, or any other things, you start to feel more symptoms. And your body is essentially triggering all these things to tell you, hey, we cannot do any more of that. We are breaking down. You need to slow down. You need to stop. You need to do the opposite of what you're doing. Whether it's eating too much junk food, you're gonna feel physically sick. Your gut will start to go out of balance. Maybe emotionally, you can't handle certain things. Maybe even watching a Disney movie will literally bring tears to your eyes. That actually happened to me. I watched Moana. I mentioned this in another video. I watched Moana and then I had tears coming down my eyes by the end of the movie because I was so emotional that bucket was already completely filled because i was so emotional about like losing my job and my car it felt like i had basically lost my lifestyle I lost who i was as a person because i was completely bedridden lost everything so i was very emotional so the smallest thing would put me over that edge and i'd have tears streaming down my face even from a disney movie same thing with thinking i had tons of brain fog but a solution for that is essentially putting all of these symptoms under that main umbrella of a hypersensitive nervous system. Whether it's brain fog, whether it's fatigue, whether it's IBS and the POT symptoms, all of these different things, chronic pain, you can pretty much put them under the same bucket, that same umbrella of a hypersensitive nervous system. And if you just focus on treating the one problem, which is a hypersensitive nervous system versus treating 20 different problems, the brain fog will go away. It will get fixed. It won't happen overnight, but it will get better and you'll start to think more clear. You'll start to be able to articulate your words better. You'll have sharper memory recall. And these things will start to function normally again. But you can't just go after the brain fog, just like you can't go after any other symptoms individually. For example, like IBS, can you do stuff that will help it? Yes, you can take some supplements, you can take probiotics, which will help, but that is just one of the many problems within that hypersensitive nervous system issue. So with the nervous system, it, it comes with a package of symptoms, not just one or two, it's usually a host of them. And that's probably why you're watching this channel right now, because it's so confusing and doctors can't figure out what's going on. They're telling you you're normal, your tests are coming back fine. But if everything checks out through your scans, through your blood tests, through the assessments that the doctors are doing, if everything checks out, and you just have a hypersensitive nervous system issue and we just have to fix that. We have to shift you more into a parasympathetic state from a sympathetic state, more into rest and digest versus fight or flight or freeze mode or the survival mode that your body's been in because it's been under stress for too long. So that's all I wanted to say about brain fog. It does go away. If you do have brain fog, if you're experiencing it, then make sure to watch these videos because these will explain a lot of the symptoms that you're feeling in addition to the brain fog, but if you are feeling that way, it doesn't matter where it came from, whether it was Lyme's, mold toxicity, long COVID, if you overworked yourself, if you had supplements, if something happened one time that caused you to go over the edge and it, your life was never the same after, it's the same thing. Usually what causes people to get into this illness is not what keeps them there. What causes them to get into this illness is an overload of stress. But even when we take that stress away, they're still stuck there because now the stress is no longer from that initial trigger. The stress is from what's going on with me. I feel like I'm gonna die every day. I don't know if I'm ever gonna get better. Will I ever get my life back? Those are the things that keep the stress loop open and it keeps that loop going.
How's it going guys? Miguel here from CFS Recovery. In this video, I'm gonna be talking about why mornings feel so rough, especially if you have CFS. Most people who have chronic fatigue syndrome experience this exact same thing. The mornings are very tough. You feel very tired, very fatigued, if not extremely fatigued. You almost feel like you have to peel yourself off the bed. Your body feels like it weighs 10 times heavier. You just feel like a sack of potatoes, right? You have brain fog, you can't think clearly, no motivation at all. Now, just to let you know, even some normal people have this feeling, but maybe not at this level. Me today, I did not want to get up. I wanted to sleep in. I hit snooze about 10 times, but I know what it's like to have that at extreme levels. So just to give you an idea, I had CFS for about four and a half years. My nervous system was extremely hypersensitive. I had tons of different symptoms. On this channel, I talk both about primary symptoms and secondary symptoms. And if you want to watch the full breakdown on that, you can look at it up here, but in this video, we're gonna be talking specifically about the mornings. Now, it's my understanding and from what I've seen with people that the reason you feel so bad in the mornings is because your nervous system has a hard time shifting into different states. Now, the nervous system is split up into two different parts. We have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for fight or flight, survival, fleeing, fighting, action, rebuilding up of the body. So movement, energy, things like that. The parasympathetic nervous system is specifically for rest and digest and repair and sleep. And so we have these two sides. Now with the hypersensitive nervous system, it is very difficult for your body to pick which side it wants to be on. For the most part, it's gonna be in a sympathetic state, which is why you feel a lot of the primary symptoms. You feel a lot of fatigue, general anxiety. You might have a wired or buzzing feeling in your body, like weird vibrations. You might not have that too, right? And you may also have secondary symptoms, things like headaches, chronic pain, high heart rate, pot symptoms, palpitations, dizziness, vertigo, this burning sensations, all of that stuff. So that's all on the sympathetic side. Now on the parasympathetic side, it's a lot more rare, but it's when you have these small windows of relaxation, which might not even exist at all for you. For most people, it does not exist. Only when you are sleeping, that's the only time you're in that state. But what happens is in the morning, your body has a hard time shifting from parasympathetic to sympathetic, right? It's a grind for your body to just shift gears like that. It has a hard time adapting to its environment. It's difficult for your body to shift from a parasympathetic state to a sympathetic state, which is needed for you to walk around and do stuff. And maybe you can't even do stuff. Maybe you're bedridden, right? So your nervous system is just confused and it's kind of like a boat starting in the water. You start the motor, it's just parked there. The blades are spinning and eventually you hit the gas and it takes a little bit of time for the boat to actually start moving. It's kind of like with your body, right? It takes a little bit of time to get your nervous system kind of warmed up and ready for the day, which is why a lot of times the mornings are very groggy. There's lots of brain fog and you just do not feel good. Very common. And so most of the time you won't really feel refreshed in the morning. It's very rare that you feel refreshed. The only time you'll start to feel refreshed is when your nervous system is functioning at a more normal level, where it's functioning kind of in between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. You can have windows of this during your recovery journey, and then it goes back to sympathetic overdrive. You can have windows of times where your nervous system is functioning normally, but for the most part, it's a slow transition, and it really is retraining your nervous system to be able to adapt to changing environments. That's why many people, they can't handle going outside when it's cold. They'll start shivering like crazy. A lot of people can't handle the heat in the summer. The summer heat will cause their symptoms to flare up and I was the exact same way. In the summer, I would definitely feel my heart rate higher. I would feel more headaches. The bright sun, would it would just hurt my eyes because it was so bright and I would get headaches among a lot of other things. And even when I drank sips of cold water, I would just take a few sips and my whole body would be shivering. It's as if someone just put me in a freezer. So my nervous system had a hard time adapting to different environments. That's what I found to be happening with my body during my recovery. I didn't just wake up and then get out of bed and then go on about doing my things. No, it was more so kind of like peeling myself off the bed. But over time, as I got the nervous system functioning more normal, that improved quite a bit. And even nowadays, I think one thing you have to understand is that normal people 
don't just jump out of bed and have all this energy. They feel like crap too, most of the time. Most of my friends, the people I know, they're not jumping out of bed feeling like a million bucks. They need a coffee, they need to splash water in their face. Why do you think coffee is so common in America or anywhere in the world? I'm not sure which part of the world you're from. Many of the subscribers are from Europe, South America, but in America where I'm from, I'm from Canada, which is in North America, it, it's hard to find somebody who does not drink coffee or energy drinks. So people need that to kind of wake themselves up. So it's completely normal for someone to feel tired and groggy in the morning. You just feel it at a whole nother level. Another thing, more than just the physical feeling of being completely drained, there's also that brain fog. What I found happening to me was my body was physically awake, but my brain was still like half asleep. So when I was at a level where I could move a bit more and I wasn't completely bedridden, I would wake up, go to the washroom, brush my teeth, and just standing there, it felt like I was on a boat, like I felt really dizzy. I couldn't even keep my own balance sometimes because my body was physically awake, but my brain, it just, it was asleep. It felt like I was in a dream and it was kind of scary to be honest. It was a really weird feeling. It was like I was in a different dimension and I break that down in my brain fog video up here. You can go check that out, but that's kind of what it felt like. So not only is your body physically trying to wake itself up. It's trying to shift from a parasympathetic to sympathetic state, but your brain function, it's still half asleep. So you feel like you're not sharp at all and you just feel really kind of sloppy. You feel yucky in the morning, if that makes sense. And if you're watching this right now, then I know you know what I'm talking about. You feel yucky. But the good news is that gets better over time. If you just follow the principles on this channel, if there's only one thing to take away from this channel, it is this. Your success in recovery is determined by how well you respond to symptoms. I guarantee you that there is anxiety and fear and worry about triggering symptoms and about the symptoms themselves when they do show up. There's lots of anxiety and negative emotion around that. That's what's keeping, that's what's fueling the fire. That's what's keeping the symptoms going. So if you handle that, then all these other problems start to dissipate. There's a person in the Recovery Jumpstart program, he did this relentlessly. You had to retrain his brain. Every time he felt like a negative thought around a symptom, he would say, hey, it's just a nervous system. Goes about doing his thing. 10 seconds later, another worry, hey, it's just a nervous system. 15 seconds later, opening the fridge to get something, hey, it's just a nervous system. You literally have to do it hundreds and hundreds of times per day. It's not easy. It's one of the hardest things you're gonna do because you are breaking a mental habit that has almost been set in stone in your brain, right? CFS and a hypersensitive nervous system disorder is not in your mind. It's actually in your brain. It's the neural pathways that are happening. Instead of going down the pathways of functioning normal and calmness and regular energy, it's going down all these other pathways that is triggering a lot of fear, worry, and triggering a lot of pain symptoms, triggering the areas of your brain that place limiters on your body. So once you understand that, it's a lot easier to recover and there's a guy in the program, he's been doing that relentlessly and we've only been working on that one thing, right? The worry towards a symptom, next thing you know, less POTS, less symptoms, less chronic pain, mornings are a little bit better, he can think a little bit clearer, less brain fog. So we didn't even attack these individual symptoms or these individual issues. We attacked the main thing, which was the response to the symptoms, because that's what keeps the fire going, that's what fuels it, and he's seeing a lot of great results. And that is the key out of this. You can't be afraid of the symptoms, and that is the key out of this. That's how you can start having things like less brain fog, less symptoms, and much better mornings. So I hope you got value out of this video. Comment down below your biggest takeaway from this video and also comment how your mornings are. Are the things that I'm sharing in this video making sense? Are you resonating with them? Do they kind of match the situation you're in? I'm really curious to hear. If you did like this video, make sure to hit the like button, leave a comment down below and make sure to hit the notification bell. The comment highlight of the day is from Perna and she says, thank you for sharing this with us. And this is Perna, this was from another video. I was seeing a doctor for a different condition, one symptom being pain, and he also referred me to Dr. Moskowitz research. So Dr. Moskowitz is a pain expert specialist. That's the guy my doctor introduced me to, not personally, but I read his work and that helped me get rid of my migraines that I had daily for months and months. First time I came across this method, I'm on day two doing it five to 10 minutes, three to four times per day when I need a nap. I doubled my walking time since starting, 10 to 20 minutes and feeling stronger, and I'm able to do more household stuff slash errands on my feet after a mini crash just five days ago. So if it's a mini crash and you're able to do household stuff and errands, then it's an adjustment period, not a crash. And I have a video breaking that down up here. I also incorporated my own NLP practice and some other root cause fears contributing to this illness. 
and some other root cause fears contributing to this illness are dissolving already, not about CFS itself. That is amazing. I'm always happy to see comments like this, to see people implementing these ideas, and just the fact that you came across Dr. Moskowitz's research is amazing. He just talks a lot about chronic pain. If you are experiencing a lot of chronic pain in the mornings, I would highly suggest watching this video up here. It's, I talk specifically about getting rid of chronic pain with this one simple exercise. That's the exercise I did first thing in the morning that helped damage in a lot of my symptoms and eventually completely get rid of them. My pain and my symptoms were 10 out of 10 before. But for things like specifically pain and nausea, this exercise really helped. It was a godsend and um, I found some amazing results doing it. I break it down for you so you know exactly what's going on so that way you can take back control and fix your chronic pain and get rid of it for good. Hey guys, how's it going? Miguel here from CFS Recovery. In this video, I'm going to be talking about CFS and irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. Now, this is a very common thing that people experience when they have something like chronic fatigue syndrome. You know, chronic fatigue syndrome is essentially a hypersensitive nervous system disorder. Doctors recognize it as a neurological disorder. They can't really explain a lot of the stuff that's going on in the body. But essentially, in my experience, based on the people I've worked with and what I've seen to work, if we just classify CFS as a hypersensitive nervous system, that will solve a lot, if not all, of these symptoms that kind of go under the umbrella of this hypersensitive nervous system issue. Now, when it comes specifically to irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, right, a lot of people can you know fall into the trap of thinking that it's actually a digestion issue. Now, it might actually be. So the first thing, as always, is make sure to go get it checked out at your doctors, make sure you do allergy tests, see doctors specifically for your gut, do a bunch of tests to make sure there's nothing actually going on in your gut. So that's step one. If they don't find anything happening in the gut, then you can be pretty confident that this is just a hypersensitive nervous system issue. Now, you know, let's rewind the clock a little bit. Growing up, I never really had issues. You know, I could pretty much eat anything. I could drink milk, dairy, gluten, sugar, chocolate, caffeine, stimulants, all of that. None of that stuff ever bothered me. But once I developed CFS or once I started, you know, getting all the symptoms of CFS, feeling more tired and wired and my health really started to decline, I found that the more symptoms I had overall, the more sensitive I was to certain foods. And it actually got to a point where I couldn't even tolerate eating candy or chocolate or any fried food or else it would literally give me panic attacks. Um, my heart would race, it would pound, I'd start to feel lightheaded. This one time I remember working um, as a personal trainer and you know we were just getting ready for the day. Everybody was hanging out and the manager decided to buy everybody some hot chocolate. And I think it was to try to entice us or encourage us or inspire us to do really well that day and sell a lot of personal training. So. We went to go get some hot chocolate at a nearby shop. And so I chugged the cup of hot chocolate and just the sugar in that and the cocoa, which, you know, there's a little bit of caffeine and chocolate. My heart was racing like crazy. And this is just one of the instances where I experienced this. There was another time where I was out with friends. This is when the CFS was just first hitting me. So at this point, I could no longer exercise. I was pulling back on a lot of activity, had a lot of symptoms. It was around Christmas time and I went to go get sushi with a bunch of friends. And we had done this dozens of times in the past, but this time it was after my first few episodes of going to the hospital due to a bunch of symptoms. And so we ate sushi, we had some fried chicken, all of that good stuff. And I woke up at, I think it was one or 2 a.m. My heart was racing, just pounding out of my chest and it literally felt like a crash. That's what it felt like. It was a lot more than an adjustment period. And so over the years, I developed this sensitivity to a lot of different foods and it just got worse. And they tested my gut for all these different things. In fact, we even tried doing many detoxes, which I did with a naturopath and flushed my system. Detoxes were absolutely brutal. You know, they really wiped me out, took a toll on my body. And even after the detoxes, the gut issues were still there, which was very frustrating because I would eat something and my stomach would hurt or I'd get upset stomach and, you know, I need to go to the washroom five times, a, you know, three to four times in a row. Here's the interesting part about, you know, me having IBS. Um, and this is how I know, at least in my case, and for a lot of other people, food 
wasn't the main thing I should have been focusing on. In certain cases, yes, if you have SIBO or SIBO, whatever, however they pronounce it, or actual things they have found in the gut that they tested for, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about if they have not found anything in your gut, but you're experiencing all these symptoms in addition to the IBS. I was living with my grandparents for six months at my absolute worst. I, I, I could barely walk, so I needed help from my 72 year old grandma to just get to the washroom. So I'd be hanging on to her. Couldn't really roll over in bed, had a hard time feeding myself. So just try to make me as healthy as possible. My grandma and grandpa would prepare all this very healthy food. And so I was eating, you know, eggs, uh, salads, sweet potatoes, uh, ginger tea every morning, avocados. I remember exactly, you know, what I was eating because every single day it was the same thing. And so I was eating extremely healthy no junk food at all, no sugar, no cookies, no chocolate, no nothing. But for six months on that diet, I just kept getting worse and worse and worse. I would have adjustment period after crash, after adjustment period, and it was just a nightmare. But my diet was perfect. And I was still getting really upset stomach, especially when I had adjustment periods or crashes. That's when it would be the worst. And when I got to the hospital, I was in ICU for you know about a month. If you, if you want to listen to my more in-depth, detailed story. You can check it out up here. It's on Raylan's channel. I really break down my story there. But what happened is after that month in the ICU, they moved me to another part of the hospital where I started working with a doctor. We started working on the root cause of all of this, which was the nervous system. We didn't try to treat my headaches, my heart rate, my shortness of breath, my irritable bowel syndrome. We just treated one problem. And he said, Miguel, basically your nervous system is hypersensitive. It's very wired. So any kind of stimulus is gonna make your body go into fight or flight mode and you're gonna feel all these symptoms. And so that's what we treated. We treated the hypersensitive nervous system disorder. And lo and behold, to my shocking surprise, as we started focusing on that, that one problem instead of focusing on 20 different problems, I started to get better. Not only did I have less pain, less headaches, less brain fog, less fatigue, less shortness of breath, 20 other symptoms were a lot less intense. My gut actually started being able to digest different foods. I remember my friend, Paul, shout out to Paul. He would visit me and this one time he dropped off a bunch of cookies and I hadn't eaten a cookie in probably a year at that point, but I started eating cookies and the first cookie was okay. It just tasted so delicious. So I had more cookies. And there were, the hospital food isn't the healthiest, but at that time it tasted absolutely delicious because I had been eating so healthy for so long that my body was like craving all this junk food. So in the hospital, I remember trading people peanut butter for jam and this and that, and I would spread peanut butter on rice cakes. I would have candy at the hospital. I'd have apple juice and sugar in it, like pop here and there. And to be honest, it wasn't the healthiest diet. I'll admit that. But the surprising thing was, what really shocked me was the fact that I could even tolerate any of these foods because even just a month or two prior, right, I almost couldn't tolerate anything. It got to that point, like, that's what put me in the hospital. I couldn't eat anything. In fact, my dad had to blend food because I just had trouble chewing and swallowing. So I actually drank. I remember one time he, he blended tilapia, rice, and boiling water just to, to make it mushy so I could drink it. And that's how I know I hit rock bottom. That's kind of what made the hospital take me seriously and actually let me stay. But I was able to eat all this different food. To my surprise, I, I was okay. In fact, I wasn't getting worse. I wasn't staying the same. I just kept getting better while I was eating all this food. And so that's a perfect example that really taught me and showed me and proved to me that this was more than just a gut issue. This is not really a diet issue. This is like a hypersensitive nervous system issue. And that's what I find with a lot of people, even in recovery jumpstart, you know, when they first come in or even on the application calls, you know, I ask them, what do they want to do? What does recovery look like? Where do they want to be? And be, what do they want to be able to do and tolerate once they get better? A lot of people say, if I could just eat a slice of pizza, if I could just eat you know, some fried chicken, if I could just eat some candy, if I could just enjoy a really nice meal and not have to worry about what happens after, I'd be happy. And I tell them, I'm like, you know, if you just follow everything we do, there's a high chance that within the next month or two, you'll actually be eating that. And so there have been many cases in the program where people come in, they can't tolerate food and within a month or two months, definitely by three months, they're able to tolerate 
more. And it's just really cool to see because what happened to me, what's happening to them. And it was really nice to know that I didn't have to avoid these foods forever, which that's what I was so used to believing. And I thought I'd never be able to enjoy really good food again, as in like junk food. Obviously now I eat a little bit healthier, but every now and then I could introduce things into my diet, knowing that it won't completely wipe me out. So when you have this hypersensitive nervous system issue, there's actually a lot of science behind it of why it's hard to digest things. So number one is when you are in a state of fight or flight mode, when your heart's pounding or your body's feeling really wired and buzzed, a lot of the blood goes to your extremities, to your arms and legs, because your body is getting prepared to run or flee or fight. That blood needs to be in your arms and limbs so you could perform all these moves. So when there's a lot of blood in your extremities, there's not a lot of blood in, in your internal organ area here, right? When your body is running from something or fighting something off, trying to just survive, it's not worried about digesting. It's not worried about a lot of stuff that goes on here. So it prioritizes movement of the arms and legs and those kind of functions versus digestion, which is why a lot of the times we'll, we'll eat food and it feels like, our body is having a hard time digesting that food. It's because there's not much blood in, in this area. It's all in our limbs, our, our body's focused on fight or flight or freezing in the situation, not so much rest and digest, right? So that's why it's called rest and digest because when you are resting, when you're in parasympathetic mode, that's when your body allows itself to digest because the blood starts to go into your internal organs. So this kind of explains why, especially when you're feeling extra anxious, extra wired, and have that extra buzzing feeling, it's hard to digest food. In fact, I just pulled up something on my phone here. Worry about things like money, career, relationships, and your health and ongoing anxiety can make you experience IBS more intensely. It can feel like anxious thoughts and fears make IBS symptoms come on. If you have IBS, it may just be that you're more sensitive to emotional troubles or worries. Some people with irritable bowel syndrome report psychological symptoms such as depression or anxiety. This occurs mainly in people who experience more severe symptoms. Now, it can go back and forth. So maybe you're in an adjustment period and you're upset that you can't move around and do all these things that you used to do and you start feeling down. That puts you in a stress state. When you're in that stress state, you get a lot of IBS because the blood, like I said, it goes to your extremities and that doesn't really digest properly. Digesting isn't the priority of your body when it's in fight or flight. So it causes IBS symptoms and having those symptoms maybe upsets you even more, which makes you more stressed, which leads to more IBS symptoms, which you can see how this whole thing can snowball and get out of control, kind of like how it does with every other symptom. And that's why CFS is so tricky. You know, I don't even like to call it CFS when I'm on the group coaching calls with people in Recovery Jumpstart. I call it a hypersensitive nervous system issue because that's essentially what it is. Even people with mitochondria dysfunctions, it's the same thing. It's a hypersensitive nervous system issue. They're getting better with the same approach that people with mold toxicity, people with long COVID, people who have been wiped out by some kind of bronchitis or flu or strong virus. It's the same approach because all we're trying to do is fix a hypersensitive nervous system disorder if tests have ruled out any other causes of this, any other obvious causes that explain everything that's going on. That's just something to think about. If you have IBS, a lot of people go down the route of trying to fix it, but you can't really fix something if it's not the root cause. Like you could take all these supplements for your gut, but if we're not fixing the root cause of this, which is a hypersensitive nervous system issue, then we're going to have to continue using these band-aid fixes. And in the long run, that can lead to more harm than good. So again, just, you know, make sure you get all the tests done to rule out anything that's happening with the gut. That's really going to help you focus on the root cause of a lot of this. And the chances are very high that this is a hypersensitive nervous system issue that we're dealing with here. Not so much IBS. You may have IBS symptoms, but the root cause is different. But make sure you go get that checked out. You know, I don't want to tell you something, a potential treatment when you haven't checked this stuff out. It's really important that you go um, you go see a doctor for this, but once you rule it out, cross it off the list and we can focus on the, the root cause of this stuff. So hope you enjoyed this video. If you got some value out of it, make sure to hit that like button, hit subscribe, make sure to comment down below what kind of foods could you tolerate before and can't tolerate anymore. Type down below and also if you could eat any food, what would it be? I'm curious to, to know what you guys picked. I remember when I was really sick, I actually wrote down a whole page of food 
that I would have loved to eat. I and mean, I'll actually put it up right here. It's really cool list of food and you know luckily i've been able to eat most of that stuff there's some stuff i just haven't gotten around to but everything on that list over here i can pretty much eat and it's great you know life's good i have this new appreciation for food now because i was deprived of a lot of it for so long how's it going guys miguel here with cfs recovery in this video i'm going to be talking about sensitivity to sound and light. Now, if you're watching this video right now, then you're probably struggling with something like chronic fatigue syndrome or a hypersensitive nervous system issue. Essentially, it's the same thing. Your nervous system is in a very sympathetic state where any kind of sense is amplified, whether that's touch, light, sound, sometimes even smell, any kind of sense on the body, even thoughts are amplified, even physical exertion is amplified, and so your body overreacts to it. Now, in this video specifically, like I mentioned, we're gonna talk about sensitivity to light and sound. This is something I dealt with for a long, long time. I was sick for about four and a half years, and much of that time, I was very sensitive to sound, to light, to touch sometimes, depending on how much my symptoms were flaring up, but especially when I was in a, crash or really, really thick adjustment period or even a mini adjustment period, my sensitivity to light and sound would be increased. Meaning I could be indoors all day and then when I walk by a window or the moment I step outside and that light hits my eyes just from the sun, I start getting headaches. I start getting weird body pains. Anytime I heard loud noises, I would get a headache as well. It would overwhelm me. My heart rate would go up. It's like my body would be overwhelmed with just those senses. And I think at the most extreme point, this is when I was living with my grandparents, I would have to wear a blindfold most of the day or an eye mask. We had to keep the curtains closed or I think we had shutter blinds. We kept those closed most of the day, if not all day actually, they were never open. We had to keep the light off. We just turned a lamp on by my bed. It was quite a dark room, but it had to be dark or else lots of light would, would hurt my head. I would literally get a migraine. But also touching on the sound side of things, my grandma would bring me food and then just her closing the door to the room, it wasn't like she slammed it or anything, she just closed it. That click, that would trigger a migraine. And it's interesting because these things, nothing touched me. It was light and sound, but it would cause actual physical pain on my body. I can't even really explain it. You wouldn't understand it unless you're going through it or have gone through it. I'm assuming if you're watching this video right now, then you probably are going through it. It's pretty scary at first because you're in a constant state of hyperstimulation. The smallest things like sound or light will cause pain, will cause brain fog, will cause your heart rate to go up, will cause heart palpitations. And on the outside looking in, it doesn't make any sense because I was telling my doctors this and they were looking at me like I was crazy because all my tests came back fine and they were telling me, what do you mean when she turns a light on, you get a migraine? What do you mean when she closes the door, you feel like someone punched your body and you feel pain all over? That doesn't make any sense. But looking back now and having studied a lot of the literature on this, having dealt with extreme sensitivity and come out on the other side to the point where now I could go to a concert with flashing lights in my face and I won't get a headache or have any of those weird symptoms. Having gone through that, now I understand what was going on. And so when we look at this whole issue, it is a hypersensitive nervous system issue. Now hypersensitivity, meaning your nervous system, obviously it gets overactive, it gets hyperstimulated, right? The smallest thing can set it up. Every small sensation is amplified in your body. Now your brain also has these sensory centers and I made a video specifically about this, which you can watch it up here. It talks about the brain training exercise you can use to combat the issue of being overwhelmed by light and sound. You can fix that, you can reverse that. I know because I did and many people in the Recovery Jumpstart program are reversing that. With the brain, like I said, there are these sensory centers and a good portion of that sensory center is dedicated towards processing pain. Touch, sight, hearing, smell, taste. And in a hypersensitive nervous system, those pain centers can change from a nine to one ratio to a one to one ratio, right? So 90% normal sensing, 10% processing pain to in extreme cases, it can go to 50% processing senses and 50% processing pain, which means you could eat something and those senses can trigger pain. You can see light, right? Because vision, sight is light. There's too much input going into your brain and it will trigger and it will actually cause pain on your body or overwhelm. 
same thing with sound, right? Because sound is a sense. Those sensory areas in your brain, they're shifting from 90% to 10% to 50% and 50%, right? It goes from a nine to one ratio in terms of normal sensing to pain to a one to one ratio, sensing and pain. And that means anytime you have these other senses, it will trigger pain with it, even though that shouldn't be the case in a normal body. But these pain centers actually become hypersensitive. So that's essentially what's happening. And you gotta think about it this way. With a hypersensitive nervous system, all your senses, like I said, when they're amplified, they will hit your nervous system a lot harder than they would hit a normal person's. So it all comes down to calming your nervous system down, getting into a more balanced state where you're not all the way over here in sympathetic and you're not quite all the way in parasympathetic, but you're somewhere in the middle. That's where a normal body is, but a CFS body, a hypersensitive nervous system is all the way turned up in sympathetic mode. And that's where you feel wired and tired. That's where you have these lights and sound issues. So if you work on the nervous system as a whole, a lot of these other small problems go away. Even the diet, even the ability to eat food, even the ability to go to concerts and listen to lots of music, those sensitivities can be reversed. And there's actually an awesome lady in the program, shout out to Tammy, if you're watching this, shout out to you. Then when she first joined, she didn't have much energy in the day. I shouldn't even say much energy. It was like negative. It was like minus energy, right? If this was a chart and this was like zero, this is like 10 out of 10 energy and this is minus 10. She was more so in the negative. She had to take lots of naps throughout the day and she had to take a stimulant in order to even function at a baseline level. And the smallest things would be overwhelming. And I'm happy to say that she's been putting in tons of work, been sticking to with a routine and everything is really clicking for her. And she's had this for over 10 years and severe for the past couple of years. But recently, just a few weeks ago, she was able to attend an outdoor concert, lots of light, lots of sound, and she felt okay after. Meanwhile, she was struggling to even really move around the house and then stay awake throughout the day just a couple months ago. So it just shows you how fast you can turn this around and the sensitivity thing, I totally get it because I was in your shoes not too long ago, about four and a half years ago, I was in the hospital wearing a blindfold, wearing earplugs and wearing Bose noise canceling headphones over that. So I had layer upon layer to really just dampen the stimulus of the world around me so my nervous system wouldn't just give out. So like I said, I do have a video breaking this down and going really deep into this topic about what you can do to actually reverse this pain if you're getting it. If you're sensitive to light and sound and it's causing a lot of symptoms, you can reverse that. You can make that less sensitive to the point where it's functioning normal again. Make sure you go watch that video. I'll also leave it down in the link below. It's really gonna help out, especially if you have chronic pain. If you did this video, make sure to click the link down below, hit that like button, hit that notification bell so you're reminded every time we put out a video. The subscriber highlight for this video comes from Jay and he writes, I just did 20 minutes of your brain new training and I noticed a reduction of symptoms. The interesting part is I think the reduction came from the relaxation of the nervous system other than the visual part. Kind of like when I do deep meditation, I noticed a reduction of all my symptoms, but am I doing it wrong? No, to answer that, you're not doing it wrong because if it's working, it's working. If it's working and your pain is going down, that can't be wrong. Although I noticed an improvement, I think this technical difference is important because I definitely could not reach reduction in symptoms by just doing it for a minute or two because I need 20 minutes in meditation to get relief. In other words, is the visualization part supposed to do the relief or the relaxation of the nervous system from the meditation aspect according to your technique? Honestly, I wouldn't even think about it that far. I wouldn't complicate things. If it works, it works. Whatever you did, keep doing it. So that's another thing about CFS is we wanna keep it as simple as possible. There's no exact black and white way to do something. If there is a certain thing that I tell you guys or advice I give you and you follow it and you change it up a bit, if it works, it works. And that's the most important thing. So keep doing it, Jay, keep it up. It sounds like it's working. I'm really happy it's clicking for you and you're able to notice a significant reduction in symptoms. How's it going guys, Miguel here from CFS Recovery. This channel is dedicated to helping people recover from CFS or chronic fatigue syndrome or any hypersensitive nervous system disorder. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about a very scary symptom, one of the most scary symptoms that I've experienced alongside heart palpitations and high heart rate. And this symptom is shortness of breath. Shortness of breath can be absolutely terrifying. I know exactly what it feels like. It can lead to things like panic attacks and anxiety attacks. It can feel like your lungs are literally shutting down and it can feel like you're running out of oxygen. And 
It's one of the scariest things to deal with because this one symptom can lead to a host of other symptoms, things like lightheadedness, high heart rate, tingling in the hands and feet, pins and needles, vertigo, along with a host of other things. In the beginning, I didn't get too much shortness of breath. It was typically fatigue and anxiety. I didn't even know what anxiety was at the time, but turns out, yes, I was very anxious. I was always worrying about things. At the time, I was worrying a lot about work, overthinking, I just didn't know how to shut my brain off. Eventually, that fatigue and anxiety led to more and more symptoms like brain fog, insomnia, and shortness of breath. Now, I first started noticing shortness of breath when I'd go up a flight of stairs and find it very difficult to catch my breath. And that happened quite a bit. And it wasn't just with stairs, it was even just bringing groceries into the house, even going up the stairs in my own house at the time, walking up a sidewalk that just had a slight incline and it didn't really make sense what was going on. I was like, okay, this is weird. I've never really had this before. So at first it's like, okay, whatever. I'm probably just tired, but it kept happening. And I was a personal trainer at the time. So I'm picking up weights, cleaning the gym, giving my personal training clients weights, showing them how to do the exercises. And I was getting very out of breath for some reason. Keep in mind, back in high school, I was wrestling team captain. I played football, I played rugby, did track and field. I was a very active guy, right? It's not like I was physically unfit. I was very fit on the outside at least. And prior to all of this, I was working out five times a week, no problem. So when I had this, it, it confused me. But as time went on, this shortness of breath, along with other things like heart palpitations and high heart rate all the time and insomnia, all these things compounded over each other. The high heart rate and the heart palpitations would make me feel very anxious because I thought I was having a heart attack. And in being more anxious, my breath started increasing. Then I started getting shortness of breath. I couldn't catch my breath. And that led to many panic attacks that I had. You know, there were times when I was just sitting in a car driving and I went through a tunnel and I felt almost claustrophobic because I felt like there was nowhere to run or nowhere to, to escape in the tunnel. I started getting shortness of breath and shortness of breath led to a panic attack inside a tunnel while I'm driving like 100 kilometers an hour. This also happened in malls. I remember one time I was in a food court. I was sitting down there. Then all of a sudden this thought came into my mind. Oh, what if something happens and I need to leave? The door is all the way over there, like 75 meters away. That's not enough time for me to escape the situation and I had a panic attack in the food court and it all started with me feeling anxious, having these weird thoughts, and then I started getting shortness of breath, and now I'm like, oh crap, I better get out soon to catch my breath. And shortness of breath, looking back now, knowing what I know from everything I teach on this YouTube channel about how the hypersensitive nervous system can cause the brain to place limiters on the body, I saw shortness of breath as a limiter. I now see how my brain was placing a limiter on my body in the form of shortness of breath. Now there's a lot of ways the brain places limiters on the body. There's a lot of primary and secondary symptoms as I like to call it. You can see them up on the screen here. Typically it starts out with primary symptoms and then it develops into secondary symptoms, but it gets to the point where all of these things play off of each other. They're all interconnected and lead to one another. And so shortness of breath was very scary. What helped me never really have to worry about shortness of breath again was knowing that my lungs were not shutting down because for the longest time, that's what I thought was happening. It literally feels like someone's pressing into your chest and you can't take a deep exhale or you're not getting enough oxygen. When you have the sense that you're not getting enough oxygen, your heart starts pumping really fast. You start to worry more. That leads to lightheadedness and maybe you start hyperventilating actually to try to catch oxygen and that can lead to pins and needles in your hands and feet and you can feel very lightheaded. I had that happen a few times. When I realized that there was actually nothing physically wrong with my lungs, that they were fully capable of supplying my body with enough oxygen and they were capable of functioning properly, it really helped overcome that fear. Now, I needed my doctor to tell me this and it took quite a few different scenarios for it to all click. I think one of the biggest mind shifts I had with the shortness of breath was this one time when I was in the hospital. This was at my absolute worst. At this point, I had not sleeping for about two weeks. I had been bedridden for about eight months, completely bedridden. I was on all these different supplements from a naturopath and my grandpa at the time who was taking care of me, he was helping push me up the stairs 
coming back from doctor's appointments. He was pushing me in a wheelchair. He was bringing me to my blood test. He was giving me shoulder rubs at nighttime when I was crying because I, I thought I, my life was over. He was the one praying over me. Him and my grandma were like my rock during recovery. And he actually passed away while I was sick. He had a stroke. So to have that person that you find so much support in pass away, it hits you extra hard because that is like your lifeline right there. And that is a person who was there with you through, through the darkest of times. And to see them go, it was tough. So it took my anxiety to a whole different level. Anyways, for two weeks, I did not sleep. Body was extra wired. I was crying. Just the emotions were a mess. So I ended up in the hospital because I couldn't eat for about three days at home. When I tried to eat, my dad would have to blend food. I remember he blended like rice and tilapia and warm water. It was disgusting, but I, I needed to eat at the time. Couldn't go to the washroom. Digestion was all messed up. So we ended up calling the ambulance. I get to the hospital after having not slept for about two weeks. And I'm starting to go insane here. I, I, I'm hearing voices. And uh, when you don't sleep for that long, you start to feel like you're going crazy, right? So the first night, goes by. I don't get any sleep at all. They gave me this weird medication for upset stomach. I think it was called Zofran. And it's weird because every time I would almost fall asleep, I was on the brink of falling asleep. It was like a seizure like feeling like my whole body would just jolt. It felt like you're onto a mini car crash or something that like that's how fast my body would jolt. And so I, I didn't get any sleep. So the next day I was so tired that I was having trouble breathing so much so that I told him, I was like, guys, I can't breathe. I need oxygen. I couldn't talk properly. I was basically whispering. I was like, I need oxygen. I can't breathe properly. And I was so exhausted that it was hard to like inhale. I think it was that plus the major like severe anxiety and not sleeping for two weeks. Anyways, about two hours later, it gets really bad. I cannot get a breath in, very anxious. I literally feel like I'm dying. That day they did an ultrasound and I couldn't even move in the bed. So they had to scoop me up, attach me to this thing on the ceiling and move me to another hospital bed and then roll me down there and then move me back. But eventually I felt like my lungs had stopped working. I, looking back now, it was a severe panic attack. I think I was just extremely tired, but they had two or three nurses running in and out of the room, giving me oxygen, taking measurements. They were doing an emergency x-ray because I thought my lungs had collapsed. And so I'm here freaking out. And my girlfriend at the time, she was holding my hand and I was just looking at her and I was like, man, this is it. I'm going to die. Like my whole life flashed before my eyes. I was like, okay, I accept it. 22 years old and I'm going to die right here. They do the emergency x-ray. They look at the scans. And then next thing you know, my amazing doctor comes in. Another doctor, not the one who taught me all this stuff, but the doctor who really supported me in the intensive care unit, he came in and he just said, Miguel, guess what? You're gonna be fine. You're all good to go. Go ahead and take this. And he hands me an Ativan pill. Now here's the crazy part. I was having extreme difficulty breathing. It felt like I couldn't even draw a breath. They had me hooked up to some oxygen tanks. And so he puts this pill in my hand. And as soon as he puts the pill in my hand, I took a gasp of air my body just loosened its grip on me and I could breathe normally again. I could think clearly there was no more pain and I hadn't even ingested the thing yet. So that's when I realized a lot of these issues had to do with the way the brain was communicating with my body. My brain was just sending the wrong signals to my body, causing lots of pain, causing weird symptoms, causing shortness of breath and things like that. And that's when it started to click with me. I knew something was going on with the software, with the brain. I knew my body was okay because they had ran so many different tests. I was in the ICU for about a month. And when that happened, it just reinforces this idea that I heard so many times that this is a problem in your brain. It's not a problem in your body. And when I finally met my doctor about four weeks later, after being in the intensive care unit, then he explained to me how your brain places limiters on your body in the form of symptoms. It's trying to stop you from doing more things. It's trying to stop you from doing more activity, from even thinking straight. So if you're thinking too much, your brain's gonna try to stop you from thinking by giving you brain fog. If you were doing way too much physical activity, it's gonna give you lots of pain to stop you from moving around. If you keep trying to push you that, it's gonna give you shortness of breath. It's gonna give you aches. It's gonna give you all these weird things to try to keep you put, and that made total sense to me. And so from that day forward, when he told me that, I was no longer afraid of shortness of breath. 
I no longer felt like I would just stop breathing. The fear of that was just gone because I knew it was not a hardware problem, as in structurally there was nothing wrong with my organs, but it was a software problem. The way my brain was sending signals to my body. And once I learned how to lower the stress on my brain, on my nervous system essentially, then I had a lot less symptoms and it didn't happen overnight. That was a fascinating story that, that really taught me that, wow, okay, your lungs are actually fine. They are fully capable of providing your body with sufficient oxygen that it needs to survive. And the thing that causes shortness of breath is the anxiety that you're feeling about all of these symptoms. The worry that you have if you're ever gonna get better, if you're on the right track, if you have maybe Lyme's or mold or this or that early onset of Parkinson's, maybe you have this weird thing that they've never ever discovered before. It was those things that were driving the shortness of breath. So the more I could tone those things down and just really focus on this one problem that it was a hypersensitive nervous system issue, the more the shortness of breath went away. And it was like night and day once it clicked in my mind. I was able to not buy into the symptoms as much. And granted, all of this applies to you if you've had multiple tests done in the past, you've had x-rays of your lungs, or they've checked you out for different things that they don't have solutions for, or they haven't found anything. This YouTube channel is essentially the last resort for most people. They've been turned away by doctors. The doctors have told me you're completely fine, your tests are normal, and they don't know what else to do. And that's typically the person I want to watch this content. If you have other things like actual lung issues, then it's not something that you can just retrain. You actually have to deal with those lung issues. But if you don't have anything showing up in tests, you can be pretty confident this is a hypersensitive nervous system issue. So that's how you deal with shortness of breath. It's not really dealing specifically with the shortness of breath. It's dealing with the anxiety, the constant nervousness, the constant worry. That's how you indirectly deal with the shortness of breath. And if you work on those things, I guarantee you the shortness of breath is gonna to start to go down because shortness of breath is one of the main kind of follow-up symptoms of anxiety, right? The more anxious you are, the more shortness of breath you have. And here's the thing, it's like a catch-22 because the more shortness of breath you have, the more anxiety you feel about running out of oxygen, feeling like you're gonna die. When you're more anxious, you have more shortness of breath. You have more shortness of breath, you have more anxiety, and it becomes this thing where it's, it can spiral out of control and that's when you have something like a panic attack and it can feel like you're gonna die. And once you have the panic attack, there are residual symptoms after the panic attack. And I actually break that down in one of the Recovery Science Blueprint documents that you can find in the link down below. It's pretty much the roadmap that my doctor gave me to help me understand what was going on. And it just gave me clarity on what I needed to do to get better, what recovery looked like. And I'm a very visual person, so these diagrams really helped. I pretty much narrowed it down to a handful of pages, breaking down everything that's going on with your body and what you need to do to pretty much break out of the cycle. So if you did enjoy this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and I want you to share down below what is your biggest takeaway from this video? What is the biggest thing that you learned? Because every single video we do a subscriber highlight, the highlight for this episode is from Dan. He says, I'm trying to walk once every other day around 100 meters and that works fine. Though sometimes I need a two day adjustment period, but not a crash anymore, luckily. But very interesting insight to know that you actually need the symptoms to happen to get better. That is very true. You need the symptoms to get better. You need something to retrain. Every episode of symptoms is the perfect opportunity to retrain your brain. And there is no way to recover without experiencing symptoms. And I break that down in other videos like the one you can see up here. I thought that was a really awesome comment because he started to grasp that idea, that concept that you need the symptoms to recover or else you have nothing to retrain. Miguel here from CFS Recovery, here with another video today. This is a very common thing that happens with CFS. You get a lot of weird pains. Now, if you don't have this symptom, you don't need to watch this video. This video is specifically about chest pains, shooting pains, sharp pains, the feeling that it actually feels like you're having a heart attack. Now, I had this 
all the time. And many people that I talk to also have this. It's one of those scary things because you do feel like you're having a heart attack. It'll just be like a sharp pain. Just know that this is very common. Now, the most important thing before I dive into this video is one, you have CFS, make sure you get this checked out by doctors, by specialists, that you had your scans, you've had an ultrasound, you've had halter monitor tests, things like that, if you have palpitations as well, because those are very common. With the whole heart issue, it can be super scary, right? The heart palpitations, the racing heart rate that goes with the POT symptoms, as well as the chest pain. Make sure you clear all of those. Obviously take everything I say with a grain of salt and make sure you have all of these tests and scans done before listening to a video like this. Now, if you have done all of those things, if you've ruled out any kind of heart issues and they're out of the question, then you can be pretty confident that this is just one of those CFS symptoms, chronic fatigue syndrome symptoms. I don't even like to call it chronic fatigue syndrome anymore. I like to call it HNS, hypersensitive nervous system. That's really what it is. Now, these chest pains, it's one of those symptoms that you just need to throw under the umbrella of hypersensitive nervous system, along with all the other symptoms that are unexplainable, that doctors can't find any cause or reason for. The thing about chest pains is you might feel the smallest thing, but your brain amplifies that. It actually acts like a magnifying glass. And the more you fear a certain symptom, the more the brain will go, hey, that's his kryptonite, that's his weak point. We're we're gonna make that stand out even more. We're gonna keep triggering that because this is a process that happens in the brain. A lot of the symptoms you feel, if not all of them, are being processed in the brain, especially things like chronic pain. Chronic pain is processed in the brain, not the body. Acute pain is processed in the body, but not chronic pain. So when you have these chest pains and these sharp shooting pains, it's just a false trigger happening in your mind. Now, does the pain feel real? Absolutely. It is real pain but it's chronic pain. It's not actually happening in that area of your body, but chances are, if you're watching this video right now, then you've already been through all the scans. You've already done the test and they've scanned your heart and they told you it looks fine. And it can be very frustrating hearing doctors say that because they'll look at you like you're crazy and they'll tell you, well, your heart's all normal when clearly something is wrong. It's like, does a normal heart skip that many times in the day? Do normal people have chest pains shooting pain down their arms that really mimic a heart attack? No, they don't. But it's because our nervous system is hypersensitive and your brain will do anything it can to stop you from moving around or adding stress into your life. The whole purpose of a lot of these symptoms is to slow you down. There's signals to tell you to stop moving or stop doing anything in life and they just want you to stay put. It puts you in that freeze mode or that extreme fight or flight mode where all your alarms and warning signs are going off because your body thinks it's in danger. That's what happens when you go over that stress threshold. We all have a stress threshold and you can watch a video where I talked about this, the stress threshold right up here. But once you go over that stress threshold, your body will do anything and everything it can to keep you put in order to try and keep you safe. Even if it means mimicking a heart attack, even if it means mimicking chest pains and things like that to try to keep you put. Maybe you feel it when you go up the stairs. Maybe you feel it when you leave the house and you try doing a short walk. It's giving you chest pain because it knows that's what's gonna stop you from going out and continuing to do these things. So I'm not saying just ignore it and keep pushing through the pain. I'm telling you, you don't need to be as anxious as you probably are. Because I myself, it, it got to a point where I thought I was having a heart attack every single day. Almost everything I did, I would feel chest pain and I would feel this weird tingling, numbing, sharp pain going down my left arm. And then of course, what would I do? I would go to Google, Google, why is there pain going down my left arm and I have chest pain? What do you think I found I was having a heart attack? And obviously at first you need to get these things checked out. You absolutely have to. I can't make it clear enough. I cannot stress enough that you have to make sure that your heart is actually okay. If it's okay and you've had this many times and they check you out, then it's really just your brain putting a magnifying glass on that symptom, the symptom of the shooting chest pain and the high heart rate and things like that. In this video specifically, it's the shooting chest pain. I see it so often in the program and having talked to hundreds and hundreds of people around the world, what I've found is that it's one of those things you really do have to rewire. You really do have to tell yourself hundreds of times, it's just the nervous system. It's not a heart attack. My heart isn't gonna explode, it's just the nervous system. And the thing is, even knowing this information, even believing that it's a nervous system, when that pain comes, a lot of logic goes out the window and you can get into a very emotional state. So that's where you need to constantly tell yourself it is really just the nervous system. Because I guarantee you, when the pain's not there, it's easy to see that it's just the nervous system. But when that pain does come, it changes everything. It's kind of like what Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So you having these symptoms, and things pop up here and there, that's kind of like getting punched in the face. Logic goes out the window and you can get into a very emotional state. We all have our kryptonites in recovery. For me, 
at a certain time, my biggest fear was my heart rate and the chest pains because I thought I was gonna have a heart attack. The kryptonite video, you can watch it right up here. I break that down, really, really good video. It's good for you to understand your weak points and weaknesses in recovery because until you solve those, you're gonna stay stuck. You need to face your fears head on. And if you're afraid of the shooting pains in your chest, then that's something you need to deal with before you can expect any kind of lasting results. And you don't even need to fully overcome it, but you need to be in the process of rewiring that and changing that and calming down that instant anxiety response when you have that immediate chest pain. So it's something that's a work in progress. You have to constantly work on it. You have to remind yourself of it. And that's where it really helps to be in a community of people who actually understand what's going on. Sometimes you just need reassurance from people or myself or another coach in the program. That's where it helps to have access to people who you can go to and say, hey, I'm having a bad adjustment period. I'm feeling a lot of chest pain. I don't know what's going on. We can give you some reassurance that you're gonna be okay. Granted, as long as you've had all of these things checked out by doctors. I cannot stress that enough. So there's people all the time. Actually, a few people in particular. Shout out to Joe. One of his main things is the sharp chest pain. He actually had long COVID. And it's one of the things that keeps coming up right? Because with long COVID, it affects the lungs and there can be some chronic pain lasting after you start getting rid of the virus that your body is kind of left as if a bomb went off in it. And chest pain can be one of those real symptoms. Even though the chest pain, the actual acute pain is gone, it leaves a lasting imprint, which is the chronic pain. And so that's one of his symptoms that he gets quite a bit, but he just reaches out and we help kind of calm him down, reassure him, put things into perspective, and then it really helps him. And it's not gonna happen overnight too. This is something you have to constantly work on. You have to do it over and over and over again. And over time, eventually it gets to a point where you've had this thing hundreds of times, where it gets to the point where you say, okay, if it would have taken me out by now, it would have happened. Like something would have happened. The hundred time I've felt this, there's no point stressing about it because in stressing about this, not only is it gonna keep me sick for longer, but it will actually make the symptom worse. Interesting how that works, right? Interesting how when you have certain symptoms and you get really anxious about them, they get even worse. For example, your heart rate, especially if you wear a Fitbit, don't wear a Fitbit if you're afraid of your heart rate. If you wear a Fitbit and your resting heart rate is 90 beats per minute, for me, that was my average, 90 to 100, even lying down, the whole goal was for me to keep my heart rate low. That's why I wore the Fitbit. And so whenever I would sit up to drink water or start eating, I checked my heart rate, 105, 110. And the more I saw those numbers go up, the more anxious I got about the heart rate, the higher it went. So it was like a feedback loop. So my heart rate went up a little bit, I got a little bit more anxious, and then my heart rate went up even more, I got more anxious, heart rate went up more. So it was that vicious cycle, that loop. And eventually my heart rate would go up to like 140 or 150 just sitting down. I'd have a mini panic attack or anxiety attack. Now I know why that happened. Now, as I was recovering, there were times when I was completely fearless about the symptoms, especially the heart rate, and it still physically went up. But there's a difference between you having physical symptoms in your body, but you reacting to them mentally and having mental symptoms because the mental side of things can absolutely pour gasoline on the fire that is already a symptom. I've also created another video about this, which you can find up here. We're gonna break that down very clearly. So if you're having shooting chest pains, just know that this is one of those chronic pain symptoms. The pain that you're feeling is not actually in your chest. It's actually being processed in your brain and your brain knows which symptoms to trigger to try to keep you put, to try to keep you in survival mode and freeze mode. And sometimes it's just a chronic loop that keeps playing. And sometimes it can be very random. You might not even be worried at all or thinking about your heart. You might go to reach for a glass of water and take a first sip and then you'll get chest pain. Just know that this is very normal. What you can't do is start thinking you're gonna have a heart attack, especially if this is something that happens very, very often because the more you fear it, the more it's gonna happen and you're gonna think you're having a heart attack 24 seven and it can get to the point where all day you are obsessed with monitoring your level of pain in your chest. What you do need to do is constantly tell yourself, it's just my nervous system. It's just my nervous system warning me and trying to keep me put, it's fine. That's what you need to tell yourself. Those are the five words I would tell myself all the time when I've ever had any other symptoms as well. It's just the nervous system. And I would always remind myself as well, the golden rule of recovery is your success is determined by how well you respond to symptoms. That is the most important thing. And whenever I would bring that up in my mind, I would think, okay, how am I responding to symptoms right now? Oh, 
I'm actually panicking. I'm starting to freak out. I'm worried. Well, I won't be very successful, will I? Because my success in recovery is determined by how well I respond to symptoms. It doesn't mean that the symptoms aren't there. The symptoms are there. They're very real, right? You're feeling them. You're experiencing them. But how are you responding? That's the biggest thing that you need to focus on. Because if you can control your response and stay composed, Stay cool, calm, collected as much as you can. I'm not saying you're sitting there like a monk while your body is flaring up. No, it's gonna be very uncomfortable, but what are you doing? How are you responding to them? Are you adding fuel to the fire or are you trying to let the fire cool off? Or are you trying to stay centered and are you reminding yourself that it is just a nervous system? That's what will determine how successful you are in recovery. How's it going guys? Miguel here from CFS Recovery. In this video, I'm going to be talking about restless legs. Now, restless legs, aching legs, feeling like there's elephants sitting on your legs. It's a feeling that I had a lot during my recovery and almost everybody I talk to, when they're at the level of being bedridden, pain everywhere and there's tons and tons of fatigue, a lot of people mention that they experience the same thing. And before I got very severe before I got to the point of being bedridden, I would listen to these videos online of people saying, oh, I couldn't stand the painful legs. It felt like there were elephants sitting on my legs. I never had that until I got to that point where my body was just completely making me hit a wall to the point where like my legs, it felt like I couldn't use them anymore. So I felt this a ton, especially when I got to that level of spending most of the time in bed, sitting down, being couch bound most of the time, it was extremely uncomfortable and I noticed that the more I stayed in bed, the more I stopped moving, the more I would feel this aching and this pain. And now looking back, knowing what I know now, there's a bunch of things that were going on. Number one, it was the deconditioning, which is a huge reason our bodies ache and get to that point of feeling chronic pain and stiffness all the time. So one, yes, it is a nervous system issue. We're a lot more sensitive to any aches and pains. So something that would be very small normally, we actually just feel it 10 times worse. But it was actually also a result of deconditioning. When I wasn't moving around that much, when I was in bed most of the day, my muscles would just melt away. And I found that my calves and my quads were really sore. And essentially my muscle was wasting. I noticed as the months went on, my leg muscles became smaller and smaller to the point where it was really hard to stand. And when I would try even going to the washroom, my legs would be super shaky and I had to hold onto the walls. I couldn't really balance properly. A lot of it was because my muscles were not being used. So there's a saying in the body, I used to be a personal trainer, you either use it or you lose it. So the whole reason we have muscle is to support our body, support our movements. So if we're not moving that much, our body goes, okay, we actually don't need this much muscle. So let's just start getting rid of it. There's no need to have all this excess muscle if we're not gonna use it. So that's when the muscles start to melt away. It doesn't mean it's gonna be gone forever. I found it to be a very temporary thing because there's something also called muscle memory where those muscles come back. Now, that's the deconditioning side of things, right? I wasn't using my muscles, so my body was kind of just getting rid of it. And in my muscles just breaking down, I would just feel really sore and achy. But there was another side to this discomfort, which was, so I have several other videos talking about chronic pain. You can actually find the main one right up here where I break down how chronic pain works. That achiness you feel from the muscle wasting, that pain is amplified by your brain. So when your brain is in a very stressed mode, a very stressed state, you can start to feel way more pain than normal. Even the blanket rubbing over your leg in the wrong way, that could cause some pain. I had times when my dad would just kind of hold my arm or someone would touch me and I felt pain. So this achiness that I was feeling in my muscles, it was just amplified by the chronic pain. So when I found out about the brain retraining exercise for chronic pain, that really helped with the leg pain, right? And even just moving around a little bit more, standing up, using my legs, even when I was at the point of being bedridden, that's kind of how I broke out of that. Now, my legs felt very sore, right? Extremely sore because I hadn't used them in months, but it was needed to just start reconditioning my muscles. So whenever I did have that pain and aching flare up, I would do the brain retraining exercise for chronic pain. And then eventually that dull aching pain completely went away. I no longer get that. Doing something for your calves and your quads and your hamstrings and your glutes, doing the brain retraining for chronic pain is actually gonna help that go away long-term. 
that's something that is actively in your control that you can start implementing right this second. You may not feel the effects right away, but like I said, go to that link. I'll also put it down in the description down below so you can go watch that video where I teach you how to do that exercise. Another thing you can do in the moment is if you can, if you have the capacity, taking cool showers, even cold showers, something that really helped with the leg pain was I would take two showers a day and when I say showers, I was sitting on the floor or on a chair because I couldn't really stand up at first for the first month or so when I started taking showers regularly, but I would put warm water. It was like a regular shower, but at the end of the shower, that's when I would actually use the cold water. I would especially put cold water on my lower body, on the muscles that were aching. And I found that after it just really helped that twitching and that kind of burning sensation really calm down. So I found that to be super helpful. In the long run, this is a symptom that does go away. It's one of those things that's just super annoying, but as you work on fixing the hypersensitive nervous system as a whole, it starts to fix other issues, just like the aching legs, the heavy legs. Also, if you're at a point where maybe you're not bedridden or you're not couch bound, but you're actually able to move around, what your body is trying to do is set limiters in place. So you could be walking around and you might feel like you hit a wall. Like all of a sudden your legs feel very heavy. They feel very achy and almost like your body is turning off a switch for you to use your legs. So take that as a sign. Your body is trying to tell you to slow down or even completely stop the walking just for that session. So listen to your body. If you do feel like you're running into those issues, just pull it back a little bit. We don't want it to get to the point where your body is forcing your legs to pretty much shut down because that means you've taken it way too far. That's why in the Recovery Jumpstart program, we actually help build a plan for people so that way they could increase activity little by little and they know which parameters they can stay within versus trying to just go off intuition. In the beginning, your intuition is not gonna be that developed for the activities that you can do. It's a skill that you learn as you learn how your body is working, as you learn how to respond to the symptoms better, and as you learn what the right level of activity is for you. There's no exact black or white amount of activity. It's more a gray area, but you'll have a better idea of how much to do once you have that plan in place. So take that as a sign that you're doing a little bit too much if your legs are starting to just completely shut down. If they're getting a little bit tired, a little bit achy, that's okay. But when you feel them completely hitting a wall, that's a signal that should tell you, okay, it's time to pull back. So overall, I had that aching, burning, heavy leg sensation for about a year, if not a year and a half. But over time it went away. As you start to get better and recover and introduce more things, this tends to go away. And as you learn about these things, and even just watching this video right now, you won't be nervous. You won't be super anxious when that symptom does come up, right? It can feel like a very weird feeling. It's a little bit scary when you don't know what's going on, but the fact that you're watching this right now, and now you know that this is very, very common with CFS, or any hypersensitive nervous system disorder, well, this is common and you know that it does go away. There's so many people in Recovery Jumpstart who have had this and it's went away. So don't worry if you are having this right now, don't let it frustrate you, don't start getting anxious about it. This is something that goes away with time as you recover. Now the subscriber highlight comment of this video comes from a user, it's kind of hard to read it, don't vote for Pedro, interesting name. but. This is an awesome comment. It's a little bit longer, but I think it's really good. So I'm gonna read it out here. It truly is very simple. We are not lacking energy. We have as much as the next person. The difference is that the majority of our energy is wrapped up in perpetually reinforcing the core belief that we are unsafe. The epiphany moment is when we realize that if we have the capacity to create and maintain such an extreme reality of insecurity, then we most certainly have the ability to create one of safety. It's simply a matter of realizing we are in fact safe but we've chosen by way of a billion subtle decisions every day to live under the illusion that we are not safe. And then redirecting our energy into the learning and practice of mastering new habits that build a different reality of safety. P.S. To the person reading this who is suffering and down on yourself or wondering if you could ever truly heal from this, no wonder you are exhausted. Look at all you've been through. You have survived a kind of pressure day in and day out that would break most people. You are not weak. You are the complete opposite. You are a freaking warrior. If you have the strength to endure such incredible hardship and still be going, you most certainly are strong enough to recover from this. And I think that is an amazing comment. One of the best comments on the entire channel that I've seen. There's some really good comments on here. 
but thank you for posting that comment. It was on one of the interviews we did with Nicole. You can find it right up here and she is absolutely crushing it. She was sick for about six years. Now she's really coming out of it. She's gotten her life back. You could go watch that video right up here, but if you want to have a chance to be featured in one of the next videos, make sure to leave a comment down below. What was your biggest takeaway from this video and what's some advice you can share with people watching this channel? Hey guys, how's it going? Miguel here with CFS Recovery. Today, I wanna to talk about the magnifying glass effect. Now, I've touched on this analogy in a lot of other videos. If you watched my breakdown of the science behind my recovery up here, one of the first videos I ever made on this channel, you would be familiar with this concept as well as on some of the Q&A calls, I talk about this a lot, also in previous videos. But the magnifying glass effect is essentially what happens when your brain is on high alert mode and it perceives every stressor as 10 times worse than it actually is and actually takes things that aren't stressful and turns it into something that's stressful. Now, here's why it's important to understand this. Let me take you back a little bit. When I was really sick, everything was stressful, right? The smallest things that I could tolerate before now were very hard to tolerate. Some things that were normally not stressful were now very stressful. Some things that didn't you know, bother me, now they really bothered me and I just didn't realize what was going on. I also felt like I was hypersensitive. I would watch movies and I would cry. This is one time, I'm not afraid to admit this, I'm not shy to admit this, but I was watching Moana. This is when I was bedridden and really bad. Couldn't really function. When I tried to watch a movie here and there, I'd be looking like on the side of the TV, not directly at it, but I watched Moana and I was in damn near tears. Now I wasn't near tears, I was in tears by the end of the movie. And that's a kid's cartoon, like a Disney kid's cartoon. And, and here I am like 22 years old, bawling my eyes out from Moana. Now, I didn't realize what was going on. I didn't understand why I was so hypersensitive to things, but it really came down to my brain really putting a magnifying glass on the different stresses in my life or the different stimuluses in my life. Everything was amplified, whether it was emotional or mental or physical, my nervous system would perceive it way more intensely than it actually was. So going back to the analogy, I want you to think about it like this. So if there was a spider, you know, on this table to my side over here, or just think of your dining table, if there was a tiny little baby spider, it seems kind of harmless, right? Even me, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of spiders. I'm pretty sure I'm like arachnophobic. Just crawling around, it's harmless, right? Not scary at all. But if you take a big magnifying glass and put it over that spider, that same spider is gonna appear 10 times bigger. And nothing happened to the spider, but what did change was the lens that we're looking at it through. So it's the same spider, same table, we have the same eyes, but what we're looking at it through is a magnifying glass and that's gonna make it appear 10 times bigger. It's gonna magnify it. And so that's exactly how our brain works when it's in a high stress mode. It will amplify almost everything. That's why seemingly simple tasks are a lot harder to do. Small stressors seem very big now. Things that we used to tolerate, now we can't tolerate them anymore. Whether it's bright lights or it's loud sounds, normally that wouldn't bother us as much, but now it's like it is being amplified. Our perception of things is being amplified. And that's because our brain has been under so much stress, whether it's mental or emotional or physical, usually it's mental and emotional that causes us to end up like this. But when our body reaches our stress threshold, now we're in high alert. The brain starts to go into survival mode and it thinks there's danger everywhere because it's so used to responding to stress, it forgets how to turn that stress mode off. So it, it gets stuck there. So now everything we look at is a trigger. Everything we look at seems a lot more stressful than it really is. And, and so for you watching this right now, unless you've done some really deep exercises of awareness and trying to catch yourself thinking negative thoughts, it's hard to become aware of this because these things are running on autopilot. You probably don't even know a lot of the thoughts that are going on, which is one of the first exercises we do in Recovery Jumpstart is we get everything on a sheet of paper or in a document so that way we can become aware of these things that are going on in our mind, all the extra noise. The biggest area I see this in for people with CFS and including myself is every single symptom I used to have, it would seem like the end of the world. If I have a weird pain in my chest instantly, I look at that as having a heart attack. 
if my legs are sore from walking around, I'm like, am I having a blood clot? I'm getting kind of shortness of breath. And I'm like, are my lungs failing? Am I, are they giving out? If my heart rate is high, right? Am I also having a heart attack? So all these different symptoms, my mind would instantly jump to these different triggers and I could not stop thinking about those. I could not stop thinking about, oh, what could this be? Could this potentially be a undiscovered virus that there's no cure for and now I just had to suffer for the rest of my life? And it would be kind of like a downward spiral um, that I talk about in a lot of my other videos, but one thing would lead to another. So there's this one time when I was in the hospital, I was working with my doctor, I had just met him, and we started improving my mindset and everything and doing a lot of brain retraining. So I was able to move around a lot more and he taught me this exact analogy and this concept of the magnifying glass. And even though I knew it, I was essentially moving from being bedridden to a wheelchair, wheelchair to a walker. When I was transitioning from a walker to trying to walk around on my own, my legs were sore like I had never felt before. And this is coming from someone who was an athlete growing up. You know, I played multiple sports, so I know what it's like to squat like 300 pounds or, or bench press. 185 pounds and, and go for sprints and run for miles every day. I know what kind of soreness that brings, but this was a whole nother level because I hadn't used my legs in about six months, really. No, more like eight months. I was not walking. My legs had shrunk to about half the size that they were before. I ended up bedridden for six months. And so my hip flexors were sore, my tendons were sore, everything just hurt so bad in, in my legs because they were not used to this amount of activity. And worst of all, I think my calves were, were one of the worst. And I literally thought I had a blood clot because they were so sore, they were throbbing because I hadn't worked those muscles in such a long time. I literally thought I was having a blood clot and I couldn't get my mind off it. And I knew this idea of the magnifying glass, but still even knowing it, I had to constantly remind myself like, look, your mind is jumping to conclusions. You, you really believe that this is a blood clot, but you kind of knew you were gonna be sore going into this, your doctor even told you. And a few days later it went away, but it's funny because I shared that story with my doctor and he was like, it's a good thing you recognize that. That's the biggest thing. Even though, yes, you were panicking a little bit, you knew at the end of the day that your mind was playing tricks on you and it was coming up with problems that actually didn't exist. It was trying to find answers to your symptoms when really the symptoms are warning signs for your body to slow down or they're actual just soreness in your legs. And that's more of like a drastic story because most people are not bedridden for six to eight months completely. And most people are not doing any activity for that long. For me, I wasn't, do I literally was not doing activity for that long. And then I started walking around again and um, you know, my legs really felt it. It felt like I went for a 20 kilometer run. That's how much my legs hurt. So it was really interesting, but that magnifying glass effect, every single person with CFS experiences this. Every time you have a symptom and then your mind starts trying to figure out, oh, do I have this, could I have this? That's the magnifying glass effect and work. Every time you have a weird shoulder pain or a chest pain and you think you're having a heart attack, that can be the magnifying glass at work. Now, I wanna have a disclaimer here. If you do have sharp pains in your chest, that does not mean you're probably not having a heart attack, but the chances of you actually having a heart attack are pretty low because chances are, if you're watching this content right now, if you're on this channel, then you've had multiple blood tests scans, x-rays, MRIs, maybe you even had a Holter monitor, you've seen a cardiologist, neurologist, endocrinologist, you've seen all these people and they can't find anything. And so for people watching this content, this explains why you're feeling all the things you're feeling. It's the nervous system gone wild, but in addition to that, every time you feel a symptom, you spiral in your mind mentally and you start to have panic and fear and that's what leads to more symptoms. So you get stuck in this downward spiral, but it all comes down to that magnifying glass effect. That's why things seem so irrationally scary where if you're on the outside looking in, people actually think you're crazy. People thought I was crazy and looking back now, if I was looking at myself, I would think I'm crazy because I was checking my heart rate, I was checking my blood pressure all the time. I was thinking I had early onset of Parkinson's one day, the next month I thought I had adrenal failure, the next month I thought I had fibromyalgia. Next month, I thought I had multiple sclerosis. So I was really trying to dig for an answer for this because the doctors weren't giving me an answer. So that's another tricky thing about this. And it's not all your fault, right? Your brain is doing what it's designed to do to protect you, but it gets tricky and we run into a problem when we get stuck in that state. So we need to get out of that state and just recognize that there is 
the magnifying glass effect going on right now and it's gonna be ongoing. You need to retrain your brain to take that magnifying glass off and look at things from you know a more logical and realistic perspective rather than looking at it from an anxious, fear, survival point of view. How's it going guys, Miguel here from CFS Recovery and in this video I'm going to be talking about emotional triggers and CFS. Now when it comes to emotional triggers, it's one of those tricky things because we don't realize how much stimulation it places on our nervous system. And actually any range of emotions can cause our nervous system to become very stimulated, whether it's good emotions or bad emotions. Now I have created another video just like this on my channel previously. You can find it up here and it's about emotions and mood swings. I just wanted to dive a little bit deeper onto this topic today specifically about emotional triggers. Back when I had CFS, my mood was all over the place and even the smallest of things can trigger my emotions, especially negative emotions. I felt like I was always on the edge. Something would happen in my life that normally wouldn't stress me out, but now all of a sudden it's stressing me out. So it was a little bit confusing and I wasn't even really aware that this was a part of CFS at the time. And I didn't realize just how much emotions can play into the physical symptoms that I felt. In a lot of other videos on this channel, I talk a lot about how you have different buckets of stimulus. We have different buckets that are physical, cognitive, but we also have a third bucket, which is emotional. And your nervous system, it only has so much room in each of those buckets that it can handle. And normally, when people are bedridden or they're housebound, especially if they're on their phone or watching TV or looking at screens quite a bit, they don't realize how much cognitive activity they're using up. Usually we see that cognitive is a bit more filled up than the physical, but one of the buckets that people don't realize is the emotional bucket. These are things like fear, worry, anxiety, feelings of depression, all of those things are added to that bucket. And it's a bucket that is often overlooked. That specific bucket for emotions can actually cause more intense symptoms than you realize. That's really where it originates from. So we have stimulation overall on the nervous system, but within that general category of stimulation, you have those three buckets. Like I said, physical, cognitive, and emotional. We're talking about the emotional bucket in this video. Now, the tricky thing about emotions is it usually involves people. And the thing is, people are unpredictable. A lot of times when there's emotional situations, it's like a reaction of something someone did or something someone said or what you think they might do or say. So whenever there's people involved, it can be, like I said, it's very unpredictable and it's hard to know what they're gonna do or say. So this builds up some anticipation. Also, any kind of conflict with people, this could be with a loved one, a spouse, a family member, any kind of conflict is gonna cause those emotions to come up. And remember, with chronic fatigue syndrome, it is basically a hypersensitive nervous system issue. It's a hypersensitive nervous system disorder. Let's call it HNS, right? Basically, any kind of negative sensation that you feel, anything that is, you know, like pain or discomfort or anxiety, all of those things are amplified when you have CFS. So you may not be experiencing it in your body at that level, like your body will be completely fine. This is why a lot of people's legs, they'll hurt. They feel super heavy, but when the doctors do scans and tests on them, they come back completely normal. Well, it's because the legs are actually completely normal. That's why it's coming back as normal. Emotions are directly linked to survival. And what your body is trying to do, the reason you're feeling all of these symptoms is because your body is in survival mode. It's triggering all of these symptoms because it thinks danger is around and it's trying to warn you, but it's doing it the wrong way. It's giving you all these symptoms to try to keep you still, to try to shut you down so that you stop moving or exposing yourself to stressors. So it tries to keep you stuck at home so you can avoid those things. The only way to force you to do that is to give you all of these symptoms because it's basically forcing you to avoid these situations and emotions are directly linked to that. So the more emotions you have, the more you feed into the symptoms. That's why emotional triggers, you can have an argument with someone and you can get a headache or you can feel completely wiped out after, or you probably experienced this in the past. You had conflict with someone or something and you felt like you were buzzing, like you fluttery. You felt a lot of anxiety kind of bubbling below the surface. So emotional triggers are a very real thing. Just know that they can be very unpredictable, especially because there's usually people involved. Now here's what you can do about it though. And here's a solution. In certain situations where there is conflict and there are triggered emotions, you have to really try your best to bring things back to logic. 
if you're in an emotional state, that's gonna flare up more symptoms. On the one hand, there's emotions. On the other hand, there's completely logical. Normal people, they're balanced right in the middle. Right around there, maybe not perfectly balanced, but they're gonna hover back and forth between emotional and logical. When you have CFS, a lot of what you're thinking is in the emotional side. So we need to bring you way back to the logic here because it's gonna to try to pull you back to the emotional side. So you have to try to look at things logically. Now, when it comes to emotional triggers and your symptoms are flaring up because of something emotional, you really have to take a step back and look at the situation and really ask yourself, do I have control over the situation? If I do, how much control do I have to affect change and the outcome of the situation? And you'll find that a lot of the things that you stress about, you have no control over and you're just stressing about it because your mind is going into all these hypotheticals, what if, maybe this will happen, and it's, it's all hypothetical. So you wanna be able to recognize that whenever I was getting emotionally triggered during my recovery journey, I had to take a step back and really think, okay, what can I do about this situation? Oh, I realized I can't do anything, so why am I even stressing about it? No matter what I think, no matter how many thousands of different outcomes I go through in my head, it's not gonna change anything. It's different when you can actually affect change in the situation. Now, you can actually do something about it. And if you can affect change, how much change can you affect? So maybe if you have an argument with somebody, you can say sorry. You can tell them, hey, you know what? I was wrong, you were right. Sorry we didn't get along earlier, I was looking at it from this perspective, you were looking at it from that perspective. I realized maybe I wasn't completely right, maybe you're right, or overall maybe the other person just won't listen and you know for a fact you're right, then you just leave it. You know, there's no point in trying to prove yourself right. So it's really solving these conflicts with other people to the best of your ability. Now those are emotions dealing with people. There's also emotions dealing with experiences of things that have happened in the past, maybe they were traumatic events, I don't even like to use that word trauma because, you know, based on what I went through, I would have had a lot of trauma, but I don't really see it as trauma anymore because trauma implies that something bad happened or it was a negative event. So it puts a label on an event, but most of the times when something happens, it teaches us a lesson and we just haven't taken the time to look into that situation and take the lesson out of it. For example, for the longest time, I had severe, severe trauma, nearly dying in a library. This is what pushed me over into the life of CFS. This was the final straw that broke the camel's back, but I was in a library studying, had this energy drink. Next thing you know, my heart is pounding out of my chest. My heart rate was about 180 when all the paramedics came in. So I was in a library studying, just reading a book, and I was really stressed out with work because I wanted to be the best trainer. That was the goal for a lot of my life. For my teenage years, I always envisioned it in my mind that I wanted to be the best personal trainer in the city. So my first three months in the company was absolutely horrible. I did not know how to sell anybody anything. I couldn't sell fire to an Eskimo. I couldn't sell water to a fish. I was just horrible at sales. So I almost got fired. And the managers talked to me. They were like, Miguel, you're the hardest worker here. You're first one here, last one to leave. And you're not making any sales. So we see you're trying hard, but maybe this isn't cut out for you. So if you don't sell anything in the next month, we're gonna have to cut you. Right? And this was my dream job that I was working at at the time. So I was studying every single day, reading sales books, practicing my pitch. Every waking hour, I was listening to audiobooks about sales and I was obsessed with it. And I would go to the library on my spare time, sit down, read about sales. And this one day I just drank an energy drink. And basically 10 minutes later, I ended up having an insane episode like my heart was pounding out of my chest it was like a panic attack on on steroids because my friend actually gave me this study pill and i was like what's that he's like look it's basically like adderall but it's legal i got it from amazon for 10 bucks so it's it's all natural it should be fine take it so i took that took an energy drink next thing you know my heart is pounding out of my chest and you know i rushed to the front desk people i said guys call an ambulance i can't breathe it felt like someone was hitting my head with a hammer so they called the ambulance and next thing I know, there's about six or seven paramedics rushing in there and they're pulling out oxygen. They're checking my bags if I took any drugs and uh, they put a, a blood pressure cuff on me. And I remember my blood pressure was 150 over 50, but uh, my heart rate was about 170 and I could not catch my breath. Room was spinning, felt lightheaded. And it was like that for about two hours. That right there, almost dying, like really believing that 
that was my last few minutes on earth, it was terrifying. And for the next two years, I had nightmares about that very specific event. Now that I look back on it, I survived that. So I'm actually very grateful that happened because never again in my entire life will I drink an energy drink. I will never take a focus supplement. I will never take anything to enhance my cognitive performance. I'm just gonna eat normal food and no more supplements from that point on. So that event, for the longest time, I looked at it as something horrible, absolutely horrible and negative that happened to me. But after I recovered, I realized there were many positives in that too. So if that didn't happen, then maybe things would have turned out differently. Maybe I wouldn't have gotten as sick at that time. Maybe I would have gotten sick a few years later, maybe when I had a family or when I was running another business and I had to shut everything down. So the way everything went down, I see how there were just as many positives as there were negatives in it. Whereas before, I would look at it as a traumatic event and I would only see the negative in it. So in terms of emotional triggers, when you think back on these other situations that you're running away from, I challenge you to look for the benefits in that situation. And there's somebody who talks a lot about this concept. His name is Dr. John Demartini and he has these seminars it's called the Breakthrough Experience, which helps you balance out your perceptions of things in your life, your perceptions of people, your perceptions of events, things that happened to you, but they didn't really happen to you, they happened for you. There were just as many positives as there were negatives. So we kind of went a little bit off topic here, but overall, I just want to let you guys know that emotional triggers, you know, they're a real thing in CFS and you can feel very sensitive emotionally. And the more triggered you are emotionally, the more symptoms you will feel. So you do want to keep your emotions under control. Hypersensitivity of your nervous system is rooted in emotions, in fear, in anxiety, and overall survival. So you just need to be aware of that. If you're aware of that, you're able to look at the situations and really try your best to look at them logically. Obviously it's easier said than done. Sometimes you need people around you to let you know, hey, you're actually doing okay. You're, you're actually not gonna die. Oh, remember this happened before? Well, you're gonna come out of it just again. You know, you're just in an adjustment period. Or hey, it's just your nervous system. You're not thinking straight right now. Remember that magnifying glass analogy? So all of these things, these are ideas I share on my channel. The more you equip yourself with the knowledge, the easier it is to come out of this illness because you know what to expect and you know what you need to do when these things happen. How's it going guys? Miguel here from CFS Recovery. This channel is dedicated to helping people recover from chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS and recover not just short term but for long term to recover for good. Now the topic of this video is going to be covering strange burning sensations aches and pains could be in your body, could be in your head, could be from headaches, things like that. But nonetheless, it's gonna be that weird, strange, chronic pain that seems to come and go, or maybe it's there 24 seven, that can't be explained. Now I'm somebody who's dealt with this for a very long time. I experienced this for about three years, right? This happened about a year into my illness. At first it was fatigue, lots of anxiety, headaches, heart palpitations, but the actual body aches and pains came a bit further down the road. And when they hit me hard, it was very painful. Now, most of the time for people who get lots of pain, they typically see lots of different doctors. They try to do massage, acupuncture, chiropractor, physio, and those things, they can help temporarily, but the pain always seems to come back and it seems to come and go as it pleases. And it's triggered by things that you wouldn't think would trigger pain. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit here. So if you're somebody who's been struggling with that, then stick around because I'm going to break down pretty much what's going on and also what you can do to absolutely fix the chronic pain that you feel in your body. I myself used to have pain that was literally a 10 out of 10 at times to the point where I couldn't even roll over in bed because it felt like my body was burning. So it was really difficult. However, now I don't have chronic pain anymore. I could do all the things that I used to do. I could work full time, I can travel, I can have these bright lights in my face and I won't have any chronic pain or any other symptoms. So let's turn back the clock a little bit. When I had a lot of pain, my doctors were looking at the scans and all the blood tests and it wasn't making sense to them because the pain I was feeling was not traceable to things that were actually happening in my body. And I did not understand that. It felt like my legs were on fire. They felt very heavy. A lot of times when I was in bed, it felt like there was an elephant literally sitting on my legs. My legs felt like bricks. I didn't know what was going on. I thought it was muscle wasting, which I went down that rabbit hole and 
got lost in that and then I got scared, thought my kidneys were gonna fail because my muscles were shrinking a ton. So I thought, okay, my muscles were just melting away. That's why they hurt, which explains some of it, but it didn't explain why sometimes I would do certain things and my legs would feel like they were on fire, for example. And this happens to a lot of people as well, not just me, especially a lot of people in the program. They can look at a computer screen and just looking at a computer screen, doing nothing with their legs, not moving them at all, just sitting down there, looking at a computer screen or their cell phone for long periods of time can trigger leg pain. So that right there is an indicator that the problem actually does not have to do with the legs. And so before we dive deeper into this, there is this concept that you need to understand if you're gonna wrap your head around this and apply this brain training exercise and believe and do it properly. Pain can be separated into two categories. One is acute pain, the other is chronic pain. Now acute pain is real pain that's happening. That pain that comes when you touch a hot stove when you're a kid, when you stub your toe on the corner of a table, that's acute pain. That's your body sending a signal to your brain. Think about it that way. Your body is sending a signal to your brain that there is a danger and it does not like whatever's happening and you should avoid that at all costs. That's what acute pain is. On the other hand, there's chronic pain, and this is learned pain over time. It's almost like anticipatory pain. So your brain anticipates something is gonna happen, so it triggers pain. So let's say I'm walking around and I stub my toe on this coffee table over here, and I do it once, right? I'll feel pain for five, 15 seconds, maybe 20 seconds. I could stub it five times in a row, and I'll feel it for about 15 to 20 seconds. If I stub my toe on that coffee table, for 20 days in a row, eventually my brain is gonna start to recognize that coffee table and anytime I get close to it, it's likely gonna trigger a little bit of pain in my foot just to remind me and warn me, hey, you need to stop doing this. Watch out for that corner because you keep messing up. We're trying to save you, we're trying to help you. So we're gonna put a little limiter on your body. We're gonna put these warning signs just to make sure you don't keep stubbing your toe. And if I keep doing it, guess what? That pain is gonna stick around even before I walk close to that table. Maybe just looking at that table, I'm gonna feel some pain eventually. That, that's how extreme it can get. So chronic pain is learned pain. Acute pain is actual danger that's happening to the body. And what happens is chronic pain is a limiter that your brain places on your body. It anticipates danger. So these burning sensations that we feel in our body, it feels like something's happening in our muscles, our joints, our tissues. But what's actually happening is pain is actually processed in our brain. Our pain is not processed in our body. Even if it's acute pain, it's actually processed in our brain. And what happens is there are these pain centers in your brain that become stimulated over time. And if they get stimulated again and again and again, then it can develop into chronic pain. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be a pain that stimulates those areas. When your nervous system is hypersensitive, your brain, which is attached to your nervous system, can start to run wild. There are certain areas of your brain that are triggered that typically won't be triggered, specifically chronic pain centers. So what happened to me was at first I developed fatigue, general anxiety, wired buzzing feeling in my body, shortness of breath, things like that. And then it moved on to more strange neurological things. That's when I started getting deeper into the illness. Things like severe brain fog, palpitations, pot symptoms, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to sound. And even just turning on a light, my body would be super sensitive and the light going into my eyes would trigger a headache, would trigger a migraine. Sometimes my dad just touching my arm, that would feel painful. It felt like someone punched me in the arm instead. And it would just have these weird tingling burning sensations and I couldn't explain it nor could my doctors, which only scared me more, which made me more anxious, which led to a more hypersensitive nervous system, which led to those pain centers in my brain being stimulated yet again. So the pain was like a snowball. It got worse and worse as time went on. But what you have to understand is that the pain you're feeling, first of all, it's not in your body. Most likely, if you don't have some serious injury or they can't detect something that's happening physiologically in your body, then you can rest assured that your brain is just sending chronic pain signals to your body. Now, it was very difficult because now even taking things like Tylenol might not even help. They might help a little, but that's just masking the pain. That's not really fixing the problem. The last thing you wanna do is actually mask the pain because it only comes back stronger. What we need to do is work on those pain centers and retrain those centers so that we can teach the chronic pain to go away. And the way you do that is through a specific brain retraining exercise, which I break down in very specific detail in this video up here. I'm not gonna break it down in this video because that video explains it 
the best way possible. It's only five minutes long. I would highly recommend to go check that video out, but you need to retrain the pain in your brain, right? When we don't know what's going on, it can be really scary because we think we just have to wait out these symptoms. We think we have to just lie there and wait it out and eventually it's gonna go away. That's not really how it works. There's a book that you must digest as well. Either read it or listen to it on audible.com. Either read it or listen to the audiobook version of it because this is the resource that my doctor shared with me as well as some articles from the same author. And the name of that book is The Brain That Changes Itself or and The Brain's Way of Healing. That book talks about neuroplasticity and how people have gone on to heal chronic pain that has stuck around for years and years and it's actually fascinating, it's remarkable. And I know it works because it worked for me and my pain was at severe levels. At one point when I was so bad that it felt like I was being electrocuted and I could not even lift a finger for about 12 hours, I remember that night. It was around 9 p.m., it hit me. I just rolled over in bed, all of a sudden I felt pins and needles on my entire body and it felt like someone was putting pressure on my bones and trying to break my bones. That's what it felt like. My pain was a 10 out of 10 that night. At one point, I think it was like 5, 4 a.m., but he took his finger and he touched my shin and it literally felt like someone took a baseball bat and hit me in the shin as hard as they could. It felt like my bone broke or something and it was horrible. So those pain centers in my brain were just on fire and I didn't know what was going on and the anxiety, the panic did not help at all. It was just the worst crash you could think of. But with this brain retraining, it helped me, along with a few other things that I teach on this channel, get rid of all the chronic pain and all the symptoms. Now, specifically for chronic pain, do this exercise. And I can almost guarantee that it's gonna help you if you do it enough times. Now, the thing with this is you have to be relentless when you do this. You have to challenge every episode of pain that you experience, and it works. There have been people in the program who do this and they drastically reduce their pain in a matter of weeks. And they have had this for four or five years. They didn't know what to do with it, took medication for it, seen doctors, seen specialists, and they just kept throwing medication at it. With the specific brain training, the effects, it worked faster, the effects lasted longer, and long-term it was just more beneficial, right? So this brain training exercise is highly recommended. Like I said, it's in this video up here, it's completely free. All you have to do is actually put in the work for it. And in that book, The Brain's Way of Healing, or it could be the brain that changes itself, you will see actual scenarios in that book of people who have overcome their severe chronic pain issues, people who have had herniated discs and broken shoulders and things like that. So once you understand all that, then you know how to solve the problem. The strange burning sensations in the body, that can go away. You have the ability to make that go away. Don't think it's something you have to live with for the rest of your life. Even people who were diagnosed, I'm gonna make a bold statement here, and the reason I can say this with confidence is because it actually is true. And this has happened to some people in the program. This is one lady specifically, she was diagnosed with fibromyalgia and there's pain all over the body and the feet, all over her herniated disc. And she started using the brain retraining exercise and she's in the program. So I'm constantly reminding her, make sure you're doing the brain retraining. Every call, are you doing the brain retraining? Are you feeling more pain? Do the brain retraining. Every opportunity you get, do the brain retraining. And her pain was drastically reduced. So a lot of times, depending on the doctor you go to, you might get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. The thing with fibromyalgia though, is there's no way to really measure it. And depending on the doctor, I would have gotten diagnosed with fibromyalgia based on the level of pain I was feeling over 20 doctors that I saw over those several years. Finally, I was paired up with a doctor who understood how pain worked and how neuroplasticity worked and he was able to help me get out of the hole. So I'm very grateful for that. I've seen it work for myself. I've seen it work for other people. So if you have these strange burning sensations, just know that you have the ability to make them go away along with other symptoms you're feeling. Is it gonna be difficult? Yes. Is it gonna be one of the hardest things you do? Probably, along with everything else you have to do to recover from CFS, but is it going to be worth it? 1000%. There is a whole life after CFS. I say it all the time on calls with people in the program. I feel like I'm on my third life. My first life was life before having chronic fatigue syndrome or all these symptoms and feeling like you're living in a fog, just feeling like you're living in a nightmare. There was the life before CFS. There was a life during CFS, and for me, that was about four and a half years. I counted as four and a half years because as soon as my doctor told me what was going on, I consider myself cured from that point. 
because in my mind, I knew all the answers. My body just had to catch up. That itself took about three years. The point where I was able to run 10 kilometers a week, guys do boxing, travel, all of that stuff I was able to do within three months. My second life was during CFS and it was like living a nightmare. That four and a half years of not knowing what's going on and living in this dark cloud of just negativity, feeling like you're living in a nightmare, that four and a half years felt like four and a half decades. That felt like its own lifetime. And then now there's life after CFS. So I was in the hospital just over four years ago. My life did not look like this. I couldn't even sit upright. I couldn't even look at a screen. I couldn't have these lights on. I was wearing a blindfold and earplugs all day, getting spoon fed. I couldn't move. I was getting blood thinners literally injected into me every day so I wouldn't get a blood clot. So I've been in the trenches, right? I've been in severe situations, but I'm telling you right now, there is hope after this. You can get better, but you have to put in the work. So comment down below your biggest takeaway from this video. Every single video we do a subscriber comment highlight. So the highlight for this video is actually from Alexandra and she commented on one of the videos. She said, Miguel's channel is not about pacing or improving life with CFS. It's about healing and getting back to 100% health. I fully recovered using a brain new training program based on neuroplasticity. I hit rock bottom. I tried a different program before and it did not work for me, but I kept trying and I found the approach that worked for me. Recovery is hard. This is very important. This is the real golden nugget of this comment. Recovery is hard. The hardest thing I ever did in my life, but being sick is hard also. The relationship we have with the symptoms is crucial. When we are not scared of them, we can start our recovery. Everybody has their own truth and recovers in different ways, but it is important to keep the hope alive that recovery is possible. So amazing comment, that's so true. The hardest thing to do is the brain training exercise that are needed to overcome this illness, the rewiring of your thoughts, the challenging of the chronic pain that you feel, that's extremely hard. It's even harder than that, staying sick, struggling every day with this, not knowing when you're gonna get better, continuing to miss out on life, continuing to watch the world pass you by as the clock just ticks down because time stops for nobody. So both instances are hard. At least one of them is gonna be very hard, but you're gonna get a reward from it. And that reward is pretty much a new lease on life. So if you were interested in getting some extra help on your journey, if you were looking to take your recovery to the next level and you want extra help from someone like myself who's been in the trenches, who probably understands what you're going through, maybe even better than some doctors you've worked with. I'm not saying I'm a doctor, but what I am saying is that I know what it's like to be in your shoes and I know what it's like to be stuck with all these symptoms, not knowing what to do, being rejected by doctors and being told you're crazy. And I know the solution to it because I've gone through it myself. How's it going guys? Miguel here with CFS Recovery. This video, I wanna talk about something very specific. It can lead to a lot of weird symptoms. It can lead to a lot of pain, headaches, things like that. But I'm gonna be talking about temporomandibular joint dysfunction, AKA TMJ, AKA a very tight jaw from jaw clenching. So let's back up a little bit. If you're somebody who struggles with CFS, then I know how stressful you know, this illness can be, you know, you're dealing with a lot of stuff, not just physical, but mental, emotional, you know, you kind of lose your identity because a lot of stuff that you used to be able to do, well, you can't do it anymore. Maybe you're off of work. Maybe you have to say no every time your friends ask to hang out. Maybe you're not even able to go for a walk in the park, or maybe you just get overwhelmed very easily and your whole body tenses up. What you have to understand is that when you get stressed, it is natural for the muscles to tense up. When you are stressed, you have adrenaline and cortisol running through your body. So essentially your body is getting ready to fight or fly or run away essentially, or freeze, right? Everything just gets very tense, especially with the adrenaline. You're ready to just book it, right? Or fight something off. And so what happens when your muscles get tense, it's not just your big muscles that are meant for fighting like your biceps and, and your forearms for punching and your calves and your quads and your glutes to run, it's almost every muscle in your body. And a lot of people don't realize we actually have a lot of muscles in our face, more specifically our jaw area. Think of how much we chew, how much we talk, you know, how much we use this muscle on a daily basis. You know, every time we chew, every time we bite, every time we clamp down, we are using these muscles and it can produce hundreds of pounds of force. Now, when we are tense, you know, a lot of times we don't even realize it. 
And this happens a lot to people, especially when they're sleeping. You know, they'll go to sleep, their neck and shoulders will get very tight. In addition to that, their jaws will get tight and they'll wake up finding that they're clenching their jaw. And so what happens is you get temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. Now this is a term I learned when, back in my personal training days, when I learned a lot of anatomy and how the muscles work. But when a muscle is clamped down like that for so long and just strained and, and just very tight and very activated, then it can cause strains. Not only that, it can affect other muscles around the area and it can develop this thing called trigger points. So this is getting a little more specific. I wanna keep it very broad here, but essentially when you clench down with your muscles here, your masseters and all the muscles around the jaw, sometimes you can actually feel tension go up to about here around the temples or just above and in front of the temples. And from there, if you, if you get tight knots around there or you strain muscles around here, it kind of spreads to your whole head. Now, when there's tension in the whole head, your whole body essentially starts to feel very tense because it just radiates, right? We, we call that radiating pain. And so back when I was in really bad shape, I would wake up in the middle of the night and my jaws would be super, super tight. In fact, you know, I've been to dentists in the past couple of years and they said that I shaved down a lot of my teeth just because I would clench down. For that short two to three year period of time, I would just grind my teeth. And I remember when I was in a lot of pain and would feel burning sensations and I get panic attacks, I would grind my teeth really bad because I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't move, couldn't squeeze anything, but I could grind my teeth but that led to a lot of TMJ. And so it becomes this vicious cycle where because you're so stressed, you start to clench your muscles. That in itself is very draining, but it can also lead to some actual headaches. So, you know, a lot of the headaches can be internal from the pain centers in your brain just flaring up. And I made a video about that right up here. So you could go watch more about how chronic pain works. But on the other hand, there can be actual physical pain happening in your body. So there's some people in the program, they get lots of tension headaches. And so a good thing you could do is just, you know, massage the muscles around the jaw if you find you're clenching. And there are gonna be certain parts where you press and usually it's like right behind the jaw or just, just in front of the ear, there's gonna be really tender spots there. Just roll your fingers around there. And if you find these spots that are very, very tender, that's a pretty good indicator that you have been clenching your jaw quite a bit. And so you might be asking, what's the solution to something like this? Well, one, the long-term solution is to get the nervous system you know, functioning normally again, shift more into parasympathetic versus sympathetic so your muscles aren't always tense, even subconsciously. And that's more of the long-term fix. You know, you're not gonna feel immediate relief from that, but what you could do, number two, is actually get a night guard. You know, I used to use this and technically I should still be using it, but mine kind of broke and you get another one, but it's a night guard. So it's, it's like basically a piece of rubber, almost like a mouth guard that you put in your mouth when you're sleeping. So that way when you do grind, you know, it's not teeth on teeth and there's some cushion. So it's, it's not as jarring, it's not as aggressive. You don't grind your teeth down and there's different levels of this. If you find you're grinding really, really hard, you'd want a thicker night guard. If you find you're grinding a little bit, then you know, you don't need something too thick. You just need a kind of a small layer there to protect the teeth from clashing against each other. The third thing you can do is kind of like I said, simply massaging your masseter muscles and the muscles around your jaw. And I also found up here when I was clenching my jaws, I would find these weird like muscle bumps almost in my temple that if I massage them and press them, they would, they would also radiate around my head. And that's how I knew I was, I was pressing on those right spots. And so this, this helped a lot with uh, any kind of tension headaches I had. It had to be like a two-pronged approach, especially with the headaches because it was happening internally from the chronic pain. Like I said, there's a video up here that can also help you get rid of a lot of chronic pain. But a lot of it was the physical muscles around my face just being very, very tense. And a way that the dentist knew that I was grinding my teeth like crazy was if you actually look in the mirror and you glide your teeth side by side like that, it, it's almost like a perfect jigsaw puzzle where my teeth glide past each other. These are supposed to be canines. These are supposed to be sharp. And that's kind of how I knew, yeah, I really grinded my teeth down. So that's just something to keep in mind that could be adding to some of the headaches you have. It's a very physical thing, like actually happening in the muscle. So that happens quite a bit and we don't realize it. Most of the time it happens in our sleep um, and we don't realize it. So that's where a mouth guard comes in handy. But I just want to put this video out there that, that could kind of explain why you might be feeling, 
you know, more severe headaches than usual. Because also when we're more stressed, we tend to clench more and tense our muscles. So that's going to add to a lot of the tension around this area. And this leads to tension around here, which leads to tension around your head, which kind of works its way down your body. Hope you enjoyed and took lots of value out of this video. Now that you know the basics, there's a few playlists that you can actually choose from depending on what stage you're at in recovery. And if you're dealing with pain, make sure to click on this video. This breaks down exactly how to work with pain. If you're dealing with other symptoms, watch this specific playlist up here. I also have different video series below in the description. So just select which playlist is the most applicable to your specific situation, and I'd be happy to help you. And I hope you get lots of value out of these YouTube videos. If you did want some extra hands-on help for your recovery journey, you can also apply to our Recovery Jumpstart program where you're able to work hands-on with a coach as well as myself and we'll be on live coaching calls and build a specific plan for your specific situation. If you wanted to learn more about our Recovery Jumpstart program where we help people from all over the world recover, hit the link down below. You can check out our application page and see if you qualify. If you do, we would love to hop on a quick call with you and see if we can really help you get back to thriving health. And if you are a good fit, we would love to let you into our Thriver Inner Circle community where you can talk to us every single week, every single day. Hopefully I'll see you on the inside. Remember, you are a Thriver and you are just one mind shift away from living a life with thriving health. See you in the next video.